2022 has been the year of the worker shortage. Three million fewer Americans are working today. Half of people who are quitting are not staying in the same industry. Who can afford not to work right now? Where did they go? A workforce epidemic is unfolding in America. Labor shortages, quiet quitting, employee burnout. Tonight, our experts will teach you how to find the right people, celebrate hard work, and grow as a leader. Get ready. America's Labor Crisis Live starts right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Dave Ramsey. You guys are awfully excited about a crisis. <laughs> hey, thanks for hanging out with us. We appreciate you. We appreciate the uh, 40 or 50,000 of you watching by live stream around the world right now. We appreciate you hanging out with us as well. I, this uh, whole thing started just a few months ago. Mike Rowe and I were having this conversation about all of the different variables that are hitting the workplace. And uh, he had had a guy on his podcast. He does a wonderful long form podcast that if you're not consuming, you should be. It's absolutely incredible. And, and then I had read a book and, and, and two or three different things intersected and we kept seeing this pattern of this information. And so we thought, hey, let's gather all those people together and let's have this discussion because there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on in the culture right now. And so Nicholas Eberstadt, a political economist, trained in the London School of Economics, former Harvard professor, wonderful best-selling author. Craig Groeschel, best-selling author and a pastor of the largest church arguably in America today, Life Church, and is gonna be with us. Michael Easter, who wrote a best-selling book called Comfort Crisis. We're gonna talk with him and talk about it as well. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, best-selling author of the book Paycheck to Purpose is gonna have some commentary for us on this. And Dr. John Deloney, Ramsey personality, best-selling author of the book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future from a Mental Health Perspective, is going to come at this. So we've got a whole bunch of angles, different ways of looking at it, different doors we're going to go in to the barn through to where we can kind of get all of these different variables because it's very complicated. It's not a simple one variable, one reaction. It's not we need to plant more corn because we have a corn shortage and just to get more corn. It's not that simple. There's a whole lot of things going into this societally, spiritually, uh, emotionally, mental health. Uh, uh, economically, uh, philo philosophically in terms of economics and, and looking at the, the philosophy of economics, if you will. And so I, I call Mike and I, I talked him into coming over and hanging out and co-hosting this with me. So of course, Mike Rowe, everyone knows from Dirty Jobs and uh, from his amazing narrative voice. And uh, he's just a lot of fun and has been, is just, he's, uh, I get to meet a lot of folks and I'm always happy when they're who I hope they would be. You know, and he's definitely that guy. Uh, the MicroWorks Foundation, where they put out millions of dollars of scholarships for the trades. We'll talk more about that. He's absolutely incredible. Please welcome my co-host tonight, Mike Rowe. Good times, good times. Hey, thanks for coming to hang out. So I guess you were serious. <laughs> serious about what? Come on down. Come on down to Tennessee. We'll have an honest conversation in a totally unscripted way in front of a few hundred genuine people and see if we can't save the country. All in one night. Yeah, how hard can it be, really, right? <laughs> it's, no, it's no step for a stepper, I'll tell you that. So, <laughs> um, you know, what we've got going on out there right now is we've got this, one of the things we've been talking about is all these different again, angles at which this problem of labor, this problem of getting work done is coming at us. We've got this quiet quitting, which by the way, I told our team, uh, the response at Ramsey will be a loud firing. <laughs> but the, um, so we, you know, but we've got quiet quitting, we've got the work from home movement, uh, or in some cases, the never quit working when you're at home movement or that I do nothing and claim to work from home movement, whichever way you want to look at the work from home movement, right? Uh, the mental there's a lot of movements, there. There's, there's a lot of movement there. A lot there, yeah. of movement. Yeah, so, all right. And so uh, this drift to mediocrity, this worship of doing as little as possible to get as much as you can, uh, this thing of being told during the quarantine you're not essential, uh, this, the great resignation, we've got four million jobs a month 
For the last six months, four million people quit their job a month for the last six months and went to other things. Now they're regretting it and, and they're wanting to come back, a lot of them. And now we've got the great resignation has turned into the great regret. So there's a lot going on. A ton. And it's not just... It's not just four million quitting a month. Some leave, some come back. Most of you guys know that. But if you really look at where we're sitting right now, 7.2 million able-bodied men in the prime of their life. Males. Sorry, males. <laughs> Point of order, Your Honor. <laughs> 7.2 million males between 25 and 54, able-bodied. Not only not working, but affirmatively choosing not to look for work. That was the thing that scared me. And that was Nick Eberstadt's, uh, that's in his terrific book, Men Without Work. The other thing, the other reason I'm here, honestly, is that for the last 15 years, my, my foundation has been trying to push this rock up the hill. And 12 years ago, I heard from a number of people in the trades that on average, for every five tradesmen who retire, Two, replace them year over year. This is what uh, Abraham Lincoln called the terrible arithmetic. He was referring to the slaughter at Gettysburg, but it's pretty bad math, too, when you look at what it means for a balanced workforce. So there's a it lot It means of, you're not going to have a plumber. It means that the conversation is no longer just about, hey, can a good plumber make six figures a year? Of course, the answer is yes. Or, hey... Will a good employer roll out the red carpet to attract the plumber? Of course, the answer is yes. The question is, how long do you want to wait for a plumber? Three days, four days, five days? That's what's going on, and it's not just in the plumbing trade, virtually every trade. We can't today find a single construction company in this entire country who isn't desperate to hire, and I challenge anybody to find a construction project underway that's going to finish on time and on budget. It just doesn't happen, and the result is a labor problem. Yeah. It, and it's caused by, it's, it's disturbing the economics, it's disturbing people's dreams, it's disturbing, disturbing the flow of money, it's changing everything. It's a, there's a, the ripple effect of this is, it, it's really pretty, it, it's, the earthquake analogy is very, very real. So the bottom line is that societally and culturally, there is, from a lot of different angles, a war as my friend Ken Coleman says, a war on work. It has become unpopular to work hard, whether it be physically, whether it be mentally, the push, the perseverance, the getting it done. It used to be a thing that this was what you would aspire to, and uh, it has, for a lot of different reasons, it has become really, we, we're at a, we have a war on work. And it hasn't happened, in my view anyway, overnight. It's not like we just flicked a switch and suddenly woke up and said, oh crap, you know, five against two, that's bad. 7.2 million sitting out, that's bad. This has been going on a long time. Um, it's always been very, very popular to portray the trades in popular media as the brunt of some sort of joke. Back to my plumber, you know, you close your eyes and picture him in your mind's eye. He's 300 pounds with a giant butt crack, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you've seen him on 100 different sitcoms. This is what we do. Our portrayals on Madison Avenue, our portrayals in Hollywood, um, on, on virtually every level, certainly in our schools, right? We have made an entire category of work into a kind of vocational consolation prize the thing you do if you can't get into the four-year school. So I want to say early on and at the top of this, this is not an indictment of higher education. This is not a, a cheap shot at an entire generation, whether it's millennial or Generation Z. I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I don't want to ignore the data either. It's real. The chickens have come home to roost. We have $1.7 trillion in student loans currently on the books. We have 11.2 million open positions, most of which don't require a four-year degree. The mismatch, the skills match, or the skills gap, or the will gap, if you prefer, these things are all real. So I'm really here tonight because I look around and I see our country lending money we do not have to 
thousands, hundreds of thousands of kids who are never going to be able to pay it back, to train them for jobs that don't exist anymore, that come with the magic four-year degree. This is a mistake. We have to turn the ship around. We can't own the conversation, but somebody has to lead it. And when Dave reached out, I couldn't say yes fast enough. And you guys are a part of it too, because if we do our job right tonight, then you become evangelicals, if you're not already. Because somebody has to spread the word, and if we don't, well, we're gonna be waiting three weeks for that plumber, and a whole lot more. So how is all of this impacting business, particularly small business? We do work with tens of thousands of businesses that are five to 200 team member size. Uh, and we just did, the Ramsey Research Team just did a detailed in-depth research project talking to all of them. And I haven't got time to unpack the entire white paper, but a couple of pieces of data jumped out at us as we were preparing for tonight. One in three small business owners right now, one third, say they're struggling to find employees who can or will do the work they need. Now that's whether they're tradesmen or whether they're white collar, they could be computer programmers, HR people, they, they could be ditch diggers and plumbers, they could be anything. But they're having the, they don't have the will, they don't have the look. We simply can't fill. I've got positions at Ramsey right now I could fill in a heartbeat if I could find cultural fit, and cultural fit includes work ethic. It includes the ability to leave the cave, kill something, drag it home. That's what we do, man. I mean, we're, we're here to serve people, and if you're going to mail it in, we, you're not going to win the Super Bowl, and I'll need you on my team. And so I'm one of these small business guys that's telling you this right now. i got 1,100 folk here. Now, over half of small business owners with 50 or more employees say retaining existing staff has been very challenging during the Great Resignation. Uh, we have a lower than national average turnover at Ramsey, but in the last 18 months, it's the highest it's ever been by 2x or 3x. And uh, so, but it's, and we're way lower than the national average, so we're doing better than average, but I mean, this is a suck bar. It's really low. A squirrel can get over this bar, you know, if you beat the average here, right? So one quarter of small business owners say they've had to shorten business hours due to labor shortages. And everyone in here could raise your hand and say, I have been in a restaurant, I've been in a hotel where they wanted to serve me, but they simply didn't have the people. I sat down in a restaurant the day before yesterday. I was in another state, I was in, uh, and wonderful people in there. The one guy that was waiting tables was really working hard. <laughs> and, it, you know, and there was 50, 60 people in the restaurant. Well, you'll see the signs going in. I mean, it's actually now a preemptive apology. I live a little north of San Francisco in the Republic of Marin. And um, <laughs> I have an office down in the Re Republic the of Santa Monica. The Socialist Republic of yeah. <laughs> I say it with love, but... You love to say it. <laughs> <laughs> these, are, uh, these are prosperous zip codes and it, with many, many terrific restaurants in them. And I'm telling you, for the longest time, the first sign you see when you go in is... Thanks in advance for your patience. We're working with half a crew. It's everywhere. So I think we've probably outlined the totality of the problem. The stakes are pretty real. real. You know, the question is, how are you going to fix it? Because I'm super curious. Exactly. And on the other side of this coin, going in too, there's another problem that's lending us to this. There's a, a portion of the workers that either aren't wanting to work or got, got tooled up for the wrong stuff that's not there or something along those lines. But there's also leadership crisis in America. We've got great leaders in America, but we also have some leaders that uh, routinely, uh, if you don't know and if you don't run a business, uh, by far almost every single business that's open anywhere, the largest line item in your, in your P&L is labor, your cost of labor, your payroll line. And so if, if you're running a publicly traded company and you want to artificially temporarily drive stock price up, really simple to do. If you're a simpleton with no morals or ethics, you just lay off a bunch of your people. You just, draw, you just cut them. You, and so you lay off 10% of your workforce, your profits will shoot up immediately if you, have the same, if you maintain the same revenue level. It's a short-term play, but as soon as those profits shoot up, you're gonna shoot stock price up. So if you wanna jack stock price, just jack your people. And uh, now, not everyone that's publicly traded does that, but you've been seeing it lately. Big companies laying off 10,000, 12,000, 15,000 people, treating human beings with families and dreams and fears like units of production, like something that could be trimmed as if it was a rose bush and we're cutting out the limbs. Now, I'm not trashing you if your profits are down and you're forced 
to lay off someone. I've got a friend running a big business right now is really struggling. And he was forced to lay off about 30% of his people. He didn't have the money. That's different. That's not an ethics question. That's a math thing. But these guys who are just chopping it, and, and so they're totally disloyal to their workforce in mass, and, and then they're shocked that they can't attract quality talent. Well, no kidding, doofus. You just, you, you, your loyalty goes both ways. This is a two-way street. Absolutely. And it goes, I would even say that that's the micro problem. That's the problem between employers and employees, and it fosters the very lack of essentiality that you were referring to right. before. But the bigger issue, and this was the, the big underlying theme of Dirty Jobs and every other TV show that I ever, I ever worked on, it's, it's the idea that it's not, it's not just the employer and the employee. It's, it's the level of gratitude, or the lack of it, that is really expressed by the 330 million of us who are out there, who, who rely on a balanced workforce. One and a half percent of the country right now grows all of the food that 330 million people eat three times a day. But the farmer is beset by obstacles and angry acronyms on every side. It's extraordinary the pressure that they're under. And it's extraordinary the stigmas and the stereotypes and the myths and the misperceptions that people have about where their food comes from and where their energy comes from. And what we're talking about right now is the workforce overall. My bias is skilled labor. My bias is the, the, the stigmas and stereotypes that right now, Dave, have millions of parents and guidance counselors convinced that a welder can't make six figures. Well, I know about 600 of them who are. Oh, yeah. We've got 1,500 people who have gone through our program who are working in the skilled trades right now, and they, they defy and they turn on its head every preconception that most Americans have about the work in general. So again, there's a lot going on. Yeah, so the labor crisis is really part of a deeper crisis is what we're saying. There's a lot going on out here. I mean, physically, as, as a culture, we've become addicted to comfort. We don't do anything hard. I was laughing earlier. If I can't drive to it or have it brought to me, I don't do it. You know, I mean, physically, we, 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 we whine if we can't get a parking spot close to the door at the gym. All right, we're emotionally and mentally fragile. Every little thing sets us off and we become debilitated emotionally. We can't, we can't in, endure anything. We're disconnected from purpose and from dignity and from push. And we don't know how to do hard things. This is a war on work. It's a war on the dignity of work, on the nobility of work. Again, whether it be the trades or whether it be a, a, a white collar uh, you know, programmer on a platform, it doesn't matter. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna start unpacking this for a few minutes with each of these guests. Now, Nicholas Eberstadt, I heard Nick on your podcast. He was on for about an hour and 10 minutes. I know that because that's how long I was walking and I was listening to you and trying to do hard things. And your, your, um, your taste is yeah, impeccable. My, yeah, I'm telling you. Thank you. The, the ability for Pick a Podcast by Dave Ramsey is off the charts. And so, um, but Nicholas, Nicholas was on there and uh, sadly Nick called a little bit earlier today and his favorite aunt had passed away and he had to go to the funeral, so we lost him for the, this evening. The good news is, is that Mike has completely absorbed every detail of this nerd's book, and so have, and I've, and I've gotten the high points of it, so we're, we're gonna go back and talk about it. One of the things he talks about in the book, uh, Men Without Work, and he's got a new post-pandemic version out. This guy is, again, London trained, London School of Economics trained, Harvard, former Harvard professor, American Enterprise. He's got all the digits after his name. This is important, right, because like a lot of you, I think we've all grown weary of, well, of experts just for the sake of expertise. Now, don't be talking about me. <laughs> this guy walks the walk. He's dedicated his life to understanding the data and why people work and why people don't work. And for me, I had him on the podcast because it's very gratifying when you suddenly realize that the headlines have caught up to what you've been preaching, right? It, it, when the headline, the headlines made dirty When jobs. someone writes a book and says you're a prophet, it's a good thing. It's a nice thing that, right, right. And, and you know, dirty jobs has been around a long time and my foundation started 15 years ago and nobody really wanted to have this conversation. And so I was talking anecdotally 
about what I saw on the job site. In 2008, when the country was going into a recession, dirty jobs was a big deal, and all anybody was talking about was high unemployment. But on dirty jobs everywhere we went, we saw help wanted signs. So that was the beginning of my contention that there was another narrative going on in the country where opportunity actually was alive and well, and high unemployment had nothing to do with that fact. It was Nick's book in 2015 that originally confirmed a lot of that stuff that I'd been blathering to Congress on and on about, and anybody else who would listen. And it's his republishing of that book after the yep. lockdown that so, really puts a point on it. So he's the one that found the 7.2 million males, uh, 25 to 54, that are not even in the numbers. They're not in the unemployment statistics. They're not claimed to be unemployed. They're not even looking for work. They're obviously being supported by someone else. And, uh, you know, he's the one that brought that thing up. And uh, the other thing he brought up is in, in the same breath, which is really their, their, their numbers that are uh, congruent with each other, is that the way we calculate the unemployment statistics, what was, it, what was it he called the statistical? He called it a depression era artifact. The, the Hor whole, horrible math. Terrible. Look, the, the single most unreported stat that should matter to everybody in the room is the workforce participation rate. It's also the least reported stat. We're still focused on the number of people who are unemployed. Now, it's an important number, but what Nick meant when he said it's a Depression-era artifact is that he was referring to a time when the number of people who were unemployed actually rhymed pretty well with the lack of opportunity. And so basic math said the more opportunities we create, the more the unemployed can find work and we all live happily ever after. And that we saw that in the 30s and 40s. It happened. We are in a completely different world. 11.5 million open positions today. Right? Combined with, we don't even really know how many people are out of the workforce. We still stubbornly look at the unemployment number like it was brought down on the second tablet from Sinai. It, it just is not nearly as relevant as it was. It almost is that old. But the, um, the, the, the so what we're saying is, is the actual numbers, when you dig into the data about three layers down, tell us that we not only don't have a 5% unemployment rate, we are currently have a negative unemployment rate. We have way more jobs than people actively looking for jobs, period. And you've got these 7.2 million males sitting on the sideline, and they're a microcosm uh, of a bigger problem that, I mean, there women in, even included females in that. He just discovered this stat by going through a Department of Labor stats and, and looking at what they're doing. And so then the question on the podcast was, that immediately comes up is, uh, how are they eating? <laughs> yeah. How, who, how, who's supporting them? So it gets dark, right? A lot of them are living in their parents' basement. A lot of them are dependent as Blanche Dubois said, on the kindness of strangers. Some are on the dole, some are on disability. That's a whole other conversation because fundamentally the 7.2 million number, these are, these are people who are capable of working and we, we, we can have a whole different conversation about what disability truly means, but in essence, it's a sidebar. When you really get into what these, what these men are doing, sorry, males, um, their faces in their screens. They're spending over 2,000 hours a year interacting with a screen. A full-time... In, in, in a great irony of ironies, playing Call of Duty. Yeah. D-O-O-T-Y. <laughs> or is it a D? I don't know. Um, but I know that if you work 40 hours a week, right, 50 weeks a year, what's, that's like 2,080 hours or something like that. These men are spending about the same period of time. So let's just be clear. If you can spend that amount of time on porn or on gaming, you probably could spend that amount of time programming as a remote worker and be employed. 
So let's just be, I mean, so the, the disability, if you've got the ability to stick with the screen for that long, you could be doing something on the screen that creates an income and gives you a feedback and gives you a level of dignity. Oh, so, these males are focused, for yeah, sure. They're, they're, yeah, they're focused on, yeah. That. Parasites, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, but unless we, the first thing that happens to a guy like me, because I'm an old hillbilly redneck, and so the first thing that happens to me is I get a little bit disgusted with this type of you know, outline a person. But then when you dig into it, the next thing that happens is if you have a soft heart, then you start going, and they're miserable. And Dr. John Deloney will be out later talking about the statistics of despair, the diseases of despair, the level of anxiety among this group is unbelievably high. The level of depression and the suicide rates among this group is unbelievably high. So the bottom line is it's not working well for them. It's a, they're, they're, it's a sad lot. It's not just that they're these pitiful, lazy people we should all hate or be angry with. That's my, kind of my first reaction. But then when you dig into it, the next thing that happens is I just feel really bad for them. Well, many of We them, have done them a disservice by allowing them to do this. We have convinced them that they are, in fact, not essential. Well, we told them during the quarantine. Again and again. We told whole groups of people, you're not essential. I don't know what more of a put down that you could come up with. You're not essential. Yeah, you know, I mean, when I think, this is personal for me because Dirty Jobs was the granddaddy of essential working shows. That's why I did it. And so we finished up in 2012. We got locked down. Essential work becomes headline news, and people start writing and saying, you should bring the show back, right? And I say, why not? But then when it went on the air, to your earlier point, I was kind of horrified to realize that the word essential which used to be a genuine compliment to a very specific category of unloved, unglamorous jobs, was now being used so often that you didn't have to say that someone was not essential. All you had to do was focus on the people who were. And pretty soon, just by default, yeah. a lot of people started to think that what they did didn't matter, not just to their own personal economy. And that'll cause you to sit at home. That's right. And feel okay about it, because what's the point? Yeah, what's the point? I mean, there's a hopelessness, yeah. a despair that goes with being told you're useless. You're not essential. And so this is what happens when the medical community gets and interferes and tries to do math, which they've proven they can't do. And they also, and they interfere in stuff like economics mm. and make these decisions. Because you know how we decided who was essential in the state of Tennessee? Tell me. Whoever wanted to be. Well, let me tell you That's something. That's what a government official told me. He said, are you going to reopen Ramsey? And I'm like, yeah, we're reopening. He goes, well, I thought you were open all along. We thought you were essential. And I'm like, Dad gum, I'm essential. And that's the point. Everybody is essential to somebody, even if it's just themselves. And as we go through these beats, some more than others, obviously. <laughs> but look, it's impossible. It's impossible not to think uh, George Bailey, right? Jimmy Stewart, at the end of It's a Wonderful Life, actually at the beginning, when he's standing on that bridge, looking over the side at that swirling water coming down Bedford Falls, right? and just deciding, what's the point? He, had, he didn't have anything to live for anymore, in spite of the fact that he had Donna Reed at home and those beautiful kids, and you know, he had a wonderful life right in front of him. But, but when you tell somebody that they don't matter, and then you prove it to them, and then they look around and they see really no hope and no gratitude, yeah, if you're, unless your heart is completely hard, it'll break for them. Yep. That's absolutely true. So one of the things that uh, Eberstadt, that Nick says too, is <clears throat> markets solve economic problems. They do not cure social pathologies. Now that's a mouthful. That's right. No market is going to be able to convince you that this is a good job or that's a bad one, that this is worthy or that's unworthy. Markets just look at the data. It's, it's a utilitarian result in the marketplace. There's not a spiritual element to it. There's not a moral component of this is good, this is bad. Right. In a market. It's just a, it's an execution of numbers. That's right. And it kind of goes to job satisfaction too. A lot of people will talk about job satisfaction in terms of, well, if you have it, it must be because your job is satisfying. But if that were the case, 
Like every garbage man would be miserable. Every stockbroker would be, you know, on top of the world. Every movie star would be well adjusted, right? <laughs> it, it's, it, it's your job satisfaction has much less to do with your job and much more to do with you. And that, unfortunately, is as true as it is unpopular. We don't like to hear that, but in my personal view, that's Dirty Jobs 101. The question I most often get from people who watch that show was, why is everybody having such a good time? And the answer wasn't because we were covered in somebody else's mess. It wasn't because we were scared. It wasn't because we were dirty. It was because we knew how we were doing. We knew we were engaged in a purpose, you know? And in life, cheerfulness is a big part of, of work. And we really tried to bring that back into that show. And I, and I really want to bring it in, into this conversation too. Because honestly, as my granddad used to say, if you're not laughing, the joke's on you. Yeah, I mean, the, there is a thing that when you make work uh, an evil thing that has to be, you, take, you do take the fun out of it. It becomes this thing, you're not allowed to smile. And, and you know, this whole thing of if you're happy, you should notify your face, right? And you know, you, we, you, ought to have some, you ought to have a good time with this. You ought, you ought to be laughing sometimes. You ought to be making fun of each other, cutting up. And there, there ought to be a band of brothers, a band of sisters that are causing these things to happen and relationships are deep and built. These are, this is how work should function. And it is not a, uh, you know, it's not a tyranny to be, to be stuck in that. So uh, if you're frustrated out there and you're a leader trying to hire right now, uh, we're going to throw out a little, I'm going to tell you about it a little bit later, but we, we, have a, we work with small businesses through a brand called Entree Leadership, and we have a digital thing called Entree Leadership Elite. And it's a, uh, it's a whole process of working with small businesses with tools. And one of the things in there is a lesson on hiring, the proper way to go about hiring and getting the right people on the, the, on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, as my friend Jim Collins says, and going through that process. So you can hit the QR code and get a free, a free exposure to that for a month, and you can start to get in there and, and unpack some of that. Maybe we can be of help to you in the process. So at Christmas, three people gave me a book called Comfort Crisis, including my son, Daniel. So if three people give you a book, apparently you're, somebody's saying you ought to read it. Three people give you a book on weight loss. That's an issue, right? So, trying to tell you, you know, so this book is Comfort Crisis. And so I'm like, okay, I'll read it, I'll read it, I'll read it. I, read it. I took it on vacation with us over Christmas and, and I started it. Sharon read it while I was sitting there and then one of my other kids read it while I was sitting there. Okay, I'm gonna read it. So I got it and I couldn't put it down. And Michael Easter wrote this entire book. He's an award-winning journalist, adventurer, professor at the University of Nevada. And uh, he's going to join us right now to discuss his, uh, his best-selling book, The Comfort Crisis. Hey, Michael, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you guys? Great, man. Thank you for joining us. Dave Ramsey, Mike Rowe with you. I loved your book, brother. Happy to be here. You are quite an Thank adventurer. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anybody that can hang out in the Arctic and uh, that whole story of freezing to death and everything, it was amazing. It was powerful. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yes, I was cold for a very long time in the Arctic, but I made it back and I learned a lot of things that I think have uh, shaped me and it's been a good experience overall. So one of the reasons we wanted to bring you into this is because there is a comfort crisis that goes into this whole issue of work ethic, uh, the ability to do things that are hard, as you talk about. And you, you explore the negative impact of being too comfortable. Uh, how have we become so intolerant of discomfort? Yeah, that's a great question. And I see it more as not that we've become intolerant of discomfort. I think that humans are always wired to do the next easiest, most comfortable thing. Uh, but I think what has really changed is that our environments have changed and our environments have become much more comfortable over time. So if you think about, you know, in the past, if you wanted food, you might have to run it down and hunt it and carry it home. Uh, if you wanted warmth, you would maybe have to chop down a tree, cut that up and build a fire. Everything that you needed to do to survive it took effort. If you wanted to improve your life, you were going to have to do uncomfortable things. 
Well, around the time of the Industrial Revolution, things started changing. Our world started getting slowly more comfortable. So now if you want dinner, you can Grubhub it. If you uh, get bored, you can, as you've mentioned before, you can play video games for 10 hours a day if you want to. Uh, everything is climate controlled. You know, how often, how much physical work do we have to put into daily life? And this idea, it extends to really every aspect of our daily life. You know, the things that really determine the course of your day today, the most important things in your life, they're all new, they've all been invented in the last hundred years, and they're all basically designed to make your life easier and more comfortable. My favorite part of your book, Michael, it's Mike Rowe, by the way, um, was the way you talked about boredom and how important it can be and how freaked out we get if we're not constantly stimulated. So on the one hand, you're up there in the Arctic, totally out of your comfort zone, freezing your butt off, doing a long list of things that scare the heck out of you. But then, like in between those adventures, you're so mind-numbingly bored that you have to come to terms with how to keep yourself engaged. And that, I think, is another muscle that we've really let atrophy. Yeah, so we were hunting up there, and uh, you know, you might think that hunting is action-packed if you've never hunted. It's not. It's a lot of sitting. It's a lot of waiting. I didn't have my cell phone up there. I didn't have a book. I didn't have a magazine. I didn't have a TV. So I find myself bored again, right? And to, to cure our boredom, we would do things like read the energy labels on our food. You know, you're, you're reading, oh, this has uh, 10 grams of sugar, 6 grams of protein. Wow, fascinating, you know? Um, so I use that as an entry point in the book about how boredom is this evolutionary discomfort that basically tells us whatever you're doing with your time right now, the return on your time invested has worn thin. Now in the past, that used to push us into things that would improve our life. We would maybe go hunt, we would maybe go pick food, we would maybe mend our shelters. Well now when we feel this discomfort, we have a very easy, effortless escape for, from it. It's right in our pocket at all times. Uh, the average person today spends more than 12 hours a day engaged with digital media. So that's from cell phones, that's from television, that's from computer screens. The stuff has really become our lives. Anytime you feel boredom now, you can escape it very easily. And boredom actually has quite a few upsides in terms of creativity, in terms of walking you into something that might improve your life if you were to just kind of sit with it and think on it. And also, going through times of boredom, it's also associated with decreases in stress. So people are so burned out now. Well, part of the reason is because we spend 12 hours a day on our phones and watching Netflix and watching the news and watching all these things that are just so hyper-stimulating. So one of the things you talk about is standing out from the crowd, uh, this idea that doing the hard things or hard work, in the case of tonight's idea, equals dignity. Yeah, so I think that humans, we get internal rewards, like deep internal rewards, life satisfaction from doing hard things. And that's the sort of evolutionary hack that you, you wanted to basically in the past if you were gonna uh, die because you couldn't find food, you wanted that food to be really rewarding when you found it, right? <laughs> so we've kind of been programmed over time to get reward from going through struggles, from thinking, you know, you're not gonna make it, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this, but when you do accomplish that thing, that really hard thing, it's like the best thing in the world. I mean, you think about probably the times in your own life where you can think you were happiness, they probably came after times where you had, where you had a struggle. Yeah, it creates resilience, it creates a mental callus when you do hard things. But the thing too, yes, Mike, exactly. is, is you went, it's seemingly in your book, you went from a comfortable guy, fairly ensconced in comfortable activities, to this radical quest of going into this really alien, hostile world. And that's kind of scary, I would think, to, to a lot of people. Are there baby steps? Like, can you, can you sort of tiptoe into this place of discomfort and, and, and get to the point where ultimately you're not just enduring it, but uh, embracing it? Yeah, I think so. So there's a study that totally changed my thinking about how wired we are for comfort. And it found uh, two. Two percent of people take the stairs when there is also an escalator available. Now, 100% of those people knew that taking the stairs, going through a little bit of discomfort, would give them a long-term benefit for their health. 90% of people didn't choose that. So a lot of what I talk about is trying to be a two-percenter. And what I mean by that is taking the actual stairs and the metaphorical stairs. 
Benefits come from embracing short-term discomfort to get a long-term benefit. And so if you can look for those opportunities throughout your life and take that every single time, that's like the ultimate life hack, right? That could come from literally taking the stairs. That could come from you're searching for jobs and you've filled out two applications, fill out a third. That could come from you might have to stay a little later at work to do better work. I mean, this just applies across the board. What about, um, what about cold showers? I've been reading about the benefits of cold therapy, and I got totally sold on it. I think I was listening to a guy named yes. Andy uh, Huberman. Yeah, Huberman's been, he, he sold me on this too, yeah. yeah. So I haven't taken- Cold showers uh, are good, but not when you got a bald head. It's just a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's, but it's, a, you know, it's annoying, and it's kind of painful, but it only lasts about three or four minutes. And the return, like when I get out of a cold shower, I, I feel better for a couple of hours. Like, and then I just take Huber, longer. Huberman cold. will sell you on the physiology of this. He really will. It's right. But, but the physiology is one thing. The question, Mike, is can you really get on a path? I mean, I don't, most people in this room aren't going to wind up in the Arctic, bored to death, and hunting terrified caribou. hunting yeah. caribou like you did. But, man, we can all hop in the cold shower. We can all take the stairs. What else can we do? Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it really is those little choices. It's, you know, if you think about even something like hunger, today 80% of eating is driven by reasons other than real hunger. Like, it's okay to be hungry sometimes. Now you've gone that to That can actually meddling. give you some mental benefits. <laughs> um, it really is just remembering that all good things in life, in the context of today, they usually come through uh, some short-term discomfort. You're gonna have to go through a little bit of short-term discomfort to get a long-term benefit. And accepting that, realizing that, hey, I don't have to be comfortable all the time, like you're not gonna die, right? <laughs> you're not gonna die if you take a five minute cold shower. You will come through that thinking, hey, I survived that, I feel pretty good, let's go tackle the day. And it's just stacking up those wins across the day. You know, maybe at first you're like, I just want one uncomfortable win today. We're gonna see how that goes. I had a buddy. Maybe tomorrow it's one again. Maybe yeah. the next day it's two and then three. And then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, oh wow, my life has changed. I'm a very different person. It didn't happen overnight, nor should it have. And then you're my friend who's, I got a buddy who's a Navy SEAL who told me, look, the key to surviving hell week is not to endure it, or get through it, it's to embrace it. It's to figure out a way to rewire your brain and associate progress with misery. Uh, it's a heck of a hack, but that's what your book is about. And uh, I loved it too. I read it on the plane, and uh, for a minute, I kind of wished we were gonna land in uh, the Arctic, and then I was relieved that we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, um do you think that this enters into having hard conversations? This whole comfort thing? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. I think especially when we think about, you know, we just talked about how much time um, people spend staring at screens. I think we spend a lot more time removed um, from other people in real life. And I think that we can select a group to sort of be a part of it, like behind a screen. So you can kind of go down this rabbit hole of ideas with a group of people who look, who think like you. And then if you sort of, disagree with the other side, you have this weird safety of the screen, and you've all seen it. People say horrible things on the internet. It's like if you saw those people in real life, you would never say those things to them. You would maybe even have a normal conversation, but there's something about being behind that screen where it's almost like when you're driving. There's a guy, um, a philosopher, Sam Harris, made this um, analogy. When you're driving and someone cuts you off, people will, you know, they'll raise their middle finger, they'll swear, they'll just lose their mind. But it's like if someone cut you in a line, you probably would not do the same thing, right? It, it's kind of analogous to that. So I think the internet has allowed us to sort of go down rabbit holes with like-minded people and be, um, be a little more intolerant of other people's views, or at least when we hear other views, behave more badly in responding to them. Exactly. It's, it's, um, screens have uh, allowed us with digital courage <laughs> to say and do and be things that we're really not. And uh, it's invented a whole generation of trolls that really aren't, uh, if you were to meet them in person and confront them. And it also, it's, you know, it's one of the reasons we've got this huge bifurcation and this anger on both sides of issues, whether they're political or anything social or anything else out there, and uh, the inability to have a, a civil debate. 
is entered. That's now a that's a lost art. It's a it's a lost craft. And so uh, we can bring it back though. We can make a choice to bring it back, just like you make the choice to take the stairs, just like they make the choice for a cold shower. You can put the screen down, say, I'm going to have a conversation in person. You can put the screen down when I'm bored and say, hey, I'm going to contemplate life. I'm going to contemplate uh, God. I'm going to contemplate, uh, you know, I'm just going to sit here and read the label. No, I'm not. But anyway, yeah. But yeah, that's, uh, there's a lot going on there. So. Or what happens, Mike, if you just say, look, I'm going to show up 15 minutes early for work every single day and I'm going to stay 15 minutes late and I'm going to cheerfully volunteer just as an exercise for every crappy task there is. I mean, everybody I know who's done that, who used to work at a McDonald's, is now running a McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, if you actually care and work while you're at work, it's novel. It stands out. You're right, 98% of people take the stairs. If you can be that 2% person, who shows up 15 minutes early, leaves 15 minutes late, when the boss asks, hey, who wants to do this task that no one wants to do and you raise your hand first, you're gonna go places. That stuff gets noticed. More importantly, you learn something about yourself along the way. You realize it's not that bad. Like living today is great. We're in the greatest time period of all time. I mean, I spent a month in the Arctic and it's like I'm freezing the whole time, I'm hungry the whole time, I'm bored out of my mind, just on and on and on. And so when I came back into my normal everyday life, it was like, oh my God, modern life is unbelievable. How have I ever complained about anything before, right? Like the, we live in such an amazing time and it's such a great opportunity to be alive and to just sort of exist. That is not the way to do it. You have to choose to do hard things so you can truly savor the time that you have in this amazing time period. Michael Easter, the book is Comfort Crisis. Highly recommend. It's a great read. All of you pick it up uh, at a great bookstore near you. Michael, thanks for being with us. Thanks, man. Hey, thanks for having me. It's ironic that he was on a screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, and it's ironic that we are on a screen for yeah, 50,000 yeah, people, but yeah, you people put your the screens screen. down after this is over, yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> so yeah, his point too, I remember in the book is you go from 72 degree house to a 72 degree car to a 72 degree office. And, and so we never experience anything physically, but then that sets us up for the, the inability to, to persevere. And the thing, if you do the hard things, that come, do the hard things that comes out of that is resilience. Mm -hmm. So you very seldom find someone that's highly successful that, uh, as Larry Crabb says, doesn't walk with a limp. They haven't, they haven't had things happen to them that were out of their control. They haven't been broke or broken at some point. Uh, and and the, out of that comes not only a wonderful story and a narrative that looks like a comeback kid, but also what comes out of that is resilience because it didn't kill me. It didn't kill me. I think know? they called it character. Yeah. You know, yeah. the thing tattooed on your face after years of trying. Well, I mean, it's like, I remember a story at a sales conference I went to years ago. The guy uh, was talking about a sales guy with one of the big real estate franchises, and he sold more houses in the nation that year than anybody else in the franchise. And they brought him up on stage, and he was, you know, just a little unimpressive guy. And they said, well, so, you know, tell us how you do this. How are you the number one guy? And he goes, well, it's just, it's not, real estate's not hard. Because I was in Burger King the other day, and people were sitting there looking at a home magazine. I sat down and started talking to him, and you know, by Friday, I sold him a house. And, and they said, well, weren't you afraid to sit down and start talking to him? He said, lady, I did three tours in Vietnam. Talking to somebody in Burger King is not a problem. <laughs> you know? So it's, you know, it builds resilience. It's that, you know, what is real fear? You know, public speaking. You know, what is real? What are you really afraid of? And, you know, resilience comes from having done hard things or experienced bad things and surviving them. Yeah. Whichever, whichever one it is. So there's something that goes with that. Next up is Pastor Craig Groeschel. He's the founder and lead pastor at lifechurch.com or lifechurch.tv, you might know it as. Uh, he's written multiple New York Times bestsellers. He's a good personal friend and has a wonderful leadership podcast for those of you that are in business. Uh, he leads hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. It's arguably the largest church in America today. Uh, Life Church, if you're not aware, is uh, if you have a little Bible on your phone uh, called YouVersion, 
than uh, 600 million people do around the world. It's one of the most downloaded apps in history, uh, is put out for free as a service by Life Church. is developed and continually rewritten, continually done for that. So he's absolutely incredible speaker and orator, great leader and a man of great character. He has a new book out called The Power to Change. And he and I were talking about his book on my show to help him promote the book. And I've been on his podcast a couple times and hang out at dinner and this kind of stuff. And he had some really interesting things that fit right into this discussion. And so we wanted to bring him into the discussion. The book is The Power to Change. Pastor Craig Groeschel, y'all welcome him. Thank you. Great to see you guys. Hey, Dave. Hey, Mike. Thanks for being with us, brother. How are you? Hey, I'm fantastic. I'm excited to be with you guys. You're always doing something special, making a difference, and so I'm happy to join in. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. So let's start with the leadership aspect of this. Uh, we're talking sure. about work and work ethic and the labor crisis. You've got hundreds of people on your team. You've got hundreds of locations around the nation. So how many people on the team? Let me ask total. Uh, there's somewhere around a thousand people on uh, on the team. That includes Uversion and all the different uh, different campuses. Okay, how has this labor these labor issues that we've been talking about tonight impacted a church of that size, the staffing? Well, I uh, I talked to our HR team just to make sure I'd understand how they're down in the weeds and. Uh, they told me about exactly what I was feeling, that uh, right now we do have a pretty big pool of candidates still as we're looking to um, select people for our team. Uh, it, the pool is getting broader, meaning it's more international than before. Unfortunately, the, um, it it's, almost feels harsh to say, but the candidates are not as qualified as they once were. So there may be more of them, but we're having to work a little harder to find those that have um, the technical skills or the pastoral skills that we're looking for. And then, Dave, when they join the team, kind of the biggest thing is that we are, um, we're not able to make some of the assumptions that we used to be able to make, that when they would enter, they would enter in with um, maybe a certain level of work ethic or missional buy-in, but we're having to go back and teach what we would consider in the past some of the basics of like how many hours a week is expected to work in a full-time job. <laughs> and that sounds, I'm, I'm not even being, I'm not belittling it at, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not being rude, I'm not trying to demean anybody, but I'm literally saying that that you have to start with some of the basics like that in teaching about you know prompt replies um, coming in on time and and things that we would we, in the past we would have never had to talk about but we're having to talk about some of those things and the good news is that a lot of people are they're quick to learn and adapt but they're they're entering in with really a different mindset and what used to be considered hard work it's a lot more challenging to get that out of a larger group of people than it was in the past. So as a, as a leader, take off the pastor's hat for a minute, put on the leader's hat. Sure. Uh, how are you leading through that? It's a great question. So one of the things we did, Dave, is we recognized midway last year that we just were not um, thrilled with what I'd call the missional buy-in, the um, the hunger to make a difference, and we're not we're a nonprofit, so we're not trying to make money. We're trying to, um, which is, you know, I'm, I'm super happy for anybody that's trying to make money, but we're trying to make a difference, and so there's a really really deep drive, and we weren't seeing the missional buy-in. So what we did is something we hadn't done before. We started with our top 17 leaders, and we went through a whole process of. Here's where our team's falling short, and here's what, where we want to get them um, to, and here's the why behind it. And so very, very, very basic. Then we went to the next 110 top leaders and brought them in for um, a day and a half session of going through everything again with the first top layer and then the next layer. And then we brought the whole group in um, to spend three days together and just walk through step by step by step by step of what the expectations are and not just what we expect, but the why we want this, not just from them, but why we want this for them. And then we talked about just really um, what I used to think was basic, 
eight ways to stay vibrant and successful in ministry, meaning we're not assuming that they know how to work hard and stay healthy. And so we're going over basics with them. And the really, really good news is we did that about four or five months ago and we've seen the needle move significantly. Um, and so it's not that people aren't responding to good leadership. I would say it's that they need more intentional, direct, and what I call very basic leadership than we've ever seen I mean, um, in 27 way, years of doing this. You went this. all the way to ground on that. I mean, that's a remedial reading. How much eye roll did you get? Because you took it down to the basics. <laughs> It's, 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 it's shocking. And, and, and it, we went more basic than you can imagine. So in ministry, it was everything from, you know, we spend time in, in the word, we spend time praying, we take, a, you know, we work hard and we take it out. And, it, and it, it was very basic, but there was not, um, there wasn't pushback. Uh, there was kind of gratitude, meaning, uh, and here's what I found, especially with the younger generation, Gen Z coming up, Gen Z is a little grittier. Um, they're, they're actually, um, you, you'd probably know, they're uh, typically a little better with money than some of their older brothers and sisters. And they don't mind being taught. They just haven't been mentored yet. And so it's not that they're going, you know, forget you, this is stupid. They're kind of saying, oh, I didn't really even realize this. Like, it, it, honest to goodness, there are some people that thought 40-hour work week was probably asking a lot. And we had to help them see that that's a baseline. That's where we start. And sometimes, and oftentimes, it'll be more than that. Um, and once we kind of established the baseline and put the why behind it, there wasn't, what I'd say, a lot of resistance. Uh, and we actually gave permission to, for people to say, if, if, if this isn't what you want, and if you don't really want to bring your best, then we would recommend um, that, that you take an off-ramp. And we said it very respectfully. And there were a few people that took it, uh, but not many. And there were more people saying, thank you for raising the standards. And, and we're actually happy to step up. But we had to lead them to it. Like it didn't just happen. It had to be very, very intentional. And then there was a lot of people saying thank you and other people saying, well, I didn't realize it, but okay, if that's what we're gonna do it, let's, let's do it. Craig, the thing that worries me is that <laughs> you've been talking about soft skills, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Show up on time, tuck your shirt in, be respectful, all these remedial basic things. In my world, the employers I've talked to say two things. They say, our greatest challenge is acknowledging the fact that what we really need are people who can pass a drug test, show up on time, mm -hmm. right, and, mm -hmm. and check all these boxes. The single mm -hmm. thing we're most afraid to talk about are those things. So mm -hmm. how can you get other employers to follow your example out there in the real world? Well, um, you know, like, like Dave, we talk a lot about leadership because we believe, and this isn't my quote, I think Maxwell said it, that everything rises and falls on leadership. And I think more than ever before, leaders need to step up and lead, and we can't make assumptions about basics whatsoever. Um, we have to be willing to talk about some things that might feel a little bit culturally incorrect, maybe even politically incorrect, and in order to have something great, we've got to call people to greatness. And and greatness doesn't isn't a result of half-heartedness. It's not. It's never going to um, show up when there's a uh, weak work ethic. And so we kind of have to almost redeem some of the values that uh, were once held in high esteem, and say uh, not only is working hard not evil. It's actually, from my pers perspective, I'd say it's God honoring, and it's important, and it, it is how you can make a difference. And it's not that we want to make work our king uh, whatsoever. We don't want to have an imbalanced life. We don't want to sacrifice our families. But one of the ways we love our families is to work hard and provide for our families. And so I think we need to say it not in a hateful, demeaning attitude, not to shame people for being lazy, but to, to raise the bar to say, if you want something better in your life, let's go get it. There's, there's more opportunities today than ever before. Get out of your cave, go kill something, bring it back home and, and make a difference. There's, there's, uh, it's, it's, it's easier to stand out today than ever before. If you want to stand out, if you want to make a difference, um, get up a little earlier, stay a little later, work a little harder, smile a little broader, love a little deeper, and you can make a really big difference in the world. That's powerful. Good stuff. The book Power to Change is um, one of the, you, I think you've got eight habits or eight 
uh, practices that people need to engage in. Is that right? Did I get that right? Is it eight? Yeah, so the, I, I did a podcast on um, eight of the, um, of the different habits, yeah. and then the book, uh, that kind of complements the book, so it all ties in together. Yeah, that's what, that, the one that I picked up on was what Easter was just talking about. He was just talking about doing hard things. And one of the principles, if you want to change, if you want to mm -hmm. become better in any area of your life, your spiritual walk, your marriage, your marriage, your parenting, your career, we're talking about work, your leadership tonight, those kinds of things, is you say, uh, you have to choose between the easy wrong and the hard right. We were just talking about doing hard right. things, so talk about that. Right, well, I appreciate you recommended the book, The, the Comfort Crisis, and I enjoyed that, and, and I like the example that Michael talked about, that only 2% of the people take the stairs, and uh, it, I would say, you know, that's the classic example that in life, almost everything that's worthwhile is going to take either a little more effort, a little more sacrifice, a little bit more grit, more tenacity, maybe a little better education, maybe a little more sacrifice. And so what we want to do is, you know, right now, almost everybody seems to be lowering the bar to the lowest common denominator. And you don't find greatness when you lower the bar. What we want to do is we want to raise the bar and say, if you want to have something special, if you want to make a difference, then you are going to have to choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Almost every time, not every time, but almost every time, Dave, um, in when there's a difficult decision, if there's two options, if there's, a, if there's an employee that's a little bit toxic or has a bad attitude or is um, sloppy around some edges, the easy thing to do is kind of hope or hint around. The hard thing to do is to sit down and say, hey, I need to talk to you. Things aren't going well. And if you don't make a change, we're gonna have to make a change. And here's what you need to do to get better. And so having a difficult conversation uh, makes you a little more uneasy, but that is the hard right. And so what I try to do um, is very similar to what you've been teaching people to do for years and years is whenever there's an easy, wrong or there's a hard right, what, you, what we're gonna do is we're gonna choose what we want most over what we want now. Even if it's a little bit harder, um, if it, even if people will criticize us, even if it takes uh, more work, we're gonna try to do the hard thing. And almost all the time on the other side of the hard right, there's a bigger win, a bigger blessing, a bigger impact, bigger profit, um, whatever it be. But we, we have to be a country of people. We were founded on people who did the hard right things and we have to do, do those things now. So is the labor crisis a crisis in and of itself or is it a symptom of this other thing that we're kind of talking around? I think that's a great question. And I, th I think honestly, it's, a, um, it's one of many symptoms of um, kind of a deeper problem in our world today. And I, I think one of the things is we are, we are so blessed with so many opportunities that it's hard for people not to feel entitled. And when we start handing out money, um, we start to think money's easy to come by. And um, when you know, unemployment's low and the job demand is high uh, and people don't feel like they really have to work, then they may, may feel um, it's just more entitled. And so I think you know, the bottom line is we're not entitled to anything. And the fact that we're born on third base, uh, we, we really have a responsibility to make more of ourselves because we do have so many opportunities. And again, I don't want to come down on people. I don't want to be shaming anybody for where they are. I just want to motivate and inspire people that uh, now is the best time ever to seize the opportunity. So the, to answer your question, uh, Mike, I do think that this is a symptom. I think there are other symptoms of a deeper problem. And, um, and I think one of, those, one of the roots of that would be entitlement. I think the other thing is like um, the other book, A Pursuit of Comfort, uh, choosing the easy thing, uh, lowering the common denominator to what everybody feels like is appropriate. And, and I think we can, we can do better than that. Now, so one of the things that you and I have had a lot of discussions with online and offline in front of people and, and just in private is uh, our, our friend James Clear's book, uh, atomic Habits, and you talk right. about some of that material in yours as well, this idea mm -hmm. that uh, what we're really facing is an identity crisis, and Clear says mm -hmm. if you're going to change your habit, you don't just change the tactical habit, you don't change what you're doing, you have to change your, ha change your identity and say, I am a person yep. who doesn't overeat, not I'm right. on a diet. 
You change your yes. you, you change the verbiage and talk mm -hmm. talk through that in in the context of this for a second. Sure. Well, I, I love his book and I love his message and and he inspires me and, and teaches this as well as anybody. Um, the way I would say it, which is um, just a different way of saying what he's always said, but you you typically do what you do because of what you think of you. And any time you face any situation, Dave, um, you know, someone cuts you off in traffic or someone's late to work, uh, in your mind, subconsciously, studies show you ask yourself three questions. You ask yourself immediately, what kind of situation is this? What kind of person am I? And what does a person like me do in a situation like this? What kind of situation is this? What kind of person am I? What does a person like me do in a situation like this? So if you want to change what you do, you have to change what you think of you. Um, if we want to become uh, people who uh, work hard, then what we need to do is we need to see ourselves not as someone who takes shortcuts, not as someone who looks for handouts, not for someone who looks for the easy way, but see someone who believes that we're capable of making a difference and we're capable of taking a step up and we can provide better for our family and we can be more generous. And so we don't see ourselves as a victim or we don't see ourselves as someone who's waiting on someone else to give us a break. What we wanna do is change our identity. If you wanna change what you do, change what you think of you. And so who are you? I would say to an emerging generation uh, that I like, I've got six kids and I'm seeing them rise up. I'd say that not, you're not just special because you get a trophy for showing up, but you actually have gifts. And when you put your gifts to work, you really can make a difference. And when you add value to someone else's life and you're not me-centered, but you're other-centered, that's gonna be a blessing. And that's gonna be something that people will reward. And that's what people, they're gonna wanna be around you. And so I would just take whatever, uh, I would look at people and say, where is our negative identity, the wrong view of us holding us back? And then as a pastor and as a Christian, I would try to help them have what I would call a more God-honoring view of themselves, um, or we could just make it practical. I try to make them have a better, more healthy view of themselves so that they'll have the confidence to do the right thing whenever the opportunity puts itself in front of them. And when you get comfortable in your own skin, you own the world. It changes everything because immediately you're authentic 24-7, uh, seven, seven days a week. Same guy on Sunday yep. you are on Monday. You, Same you've guy been, in traffic. You've been doing now. this since I've known you. Since you, we, well, I was in my late 20s, you were in your early 30s. You've been, you've been saying basically the same thing in basically the same way for 25, 30 years, and it, it works. People believe you. And you, you're, you're making a difference. It's something that's doable, achievable, believable, and effective. Mike, that's the nicest way anyone's ever called me a one-trick pony. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say a broken record, but it works, man. <laughs> yeah, the truth has a way of uh, resonating, right? It'll stick. Hey, man, it's effective. Why change it? Keep on doing it. Hey, I love you, my friend. I love you. Appreciate you. Hey, so the name of the you. name of your podcast for everyone, if they want to join you, it's a great leadership podcast. I enjoy being on it, enjoy consuming it yep. as well. What is it? Yes, yeah, Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Craig Groeschel, Leadership Podcast. You can find him. The book is The Power to Change. You can get it anywhere great books are sold. And one of the eight habits is this idea of choose the hard right over the easy wrong. Choose to do, again, choose to do hard things. There's a pattern developing here, Mike. So, I'm hey, Craig, thanks for being with us, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig hey, Groeschel. Hey, appreciate you guys. Thank you. Can I just say one quick thing about that for me? That's the most important thing we've heard so far, the idea of choosing your identity. And it's not like a big, giant thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. But for me, I impersonated a host for 20 years, and that's how I saw myself. I freelanced in this crazy business for a long, long time. And one day, I wound up whole long story, but I wound up in the sewers of San Francisco filming an episode for this show called Evening Magazine with a sewer inspector. And I was literally baptized in a, in a river of crap. I, I realized filming that segment that I was a better guest than I was a host. And I remember, Dave, like it was yesterday, it was 20 years ago, I started thinking of myself not as a host, but a guest. And that's when everything changed. You know, and, and that was my choice. And I think we all get to think of ourselves, we get to choose our, our well, life. And we have, we have this wonderful power of agency, this right 
to just decide, just to change, just change. I was walking through the lunchroom down here at the office the other day, and with one of our programmers, I ran into him, and he, like, has lost. I mean, he's, like, disappeared. He's lost so much weight. And I stopped him and said, man, how much weight have you lost? He's 82 pounds. Like, dude, you lost a Backstreet Boy. <laughs> that's like, unbelievable. <laughs> I said, man, that's so powerful. I said, that's, I'm standing there talking to him. And the more I, t- he's a great guy, by the way. I said, I was bragging on him. I said, this is, because it is, it's impressive, you know. It, 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 genuinely impressive. It's not flattery. It's just, wow, dude, that's, and, and the more I talked to him, I said, well, you know, what, tell me what you've been doing. And, and, and you look so good. And, you, you're, you know, your wife's got to be thrilled. I mean, your life, you've got to feel better. He was stra- standing straighter and straighter. His, you watched his identity that he was, had stepped into out of the other. You saw him shift. You saw his body language move into it as he stepped into it. And then I asked him the dumbest question. How'd you do it? How'd you lose the weight? <laughs> I ate less. <laughs> there you go. All right, that's it. So Ken Coleman Ramsey personality is up next. He has a number one best-selling book called uh, Paycheck to Purpose. And uh, he has a radio show that we produce in the Ramsey Networks. It's on 75 radio stations, a very popular podcast, very popular on Sirius XM, uh, speaks with me very regularly uh, around America when we're doing different kinds of events, whether they be in the business setting, the leadership setting, or the money. But he's our career and work expert. Um, he also makes good choices. Uh, he and Stacy have been married 25 years today, and so he's in Europe with his wife on vacation to celebrate their anniversary, but he did film us an idea or two because I want him to speak into this because he's got some important things to say in this space. So here's Ken Coleman. Thanks, Dave and Mike. I wish I was with both of you and all of these great leaders that are tuning in tonight live and around the country. I want to reframe what you leaders are dealing with in this world of work today and encourage you. I'll start by challenging you with this thought. I don't believe that we have a work ethic problem as much as we have an expectation problem. And there are two main factors in the American culture that have created unrealistic and then unmet expectations that you as leaders are having to do with. The first is the education system. Our system is outdated, and I would tell you it's broken because it is creating test takers, not pathfinders. In other words, we're teaching kids how to memorize and regurgitate facts, and so they are taught from the youngest of ages to conform, to color between the lines to make sure that the color matches up with the number that someone suggests. And so creativity is stifled. So they're not creating and thinking about how they can contribute creatively. Secondly, the education message has been, if you do good in school all the way through college and get that coveted college degree, well then it's a guarantee for success. But we know that that's not true but they come out of college feeling like, I've got my degree, I'm ready for success, show it to me. And if we hearken back to the incredible data from earlier tonight, we have millions of men without degrees who are quitting the workforce because they are ashamed of their social status. And even worse, they're staying home. They're going home to the cave and they're not coming back out because their family feels bad for them, their friends, are supporting them so they don't have to go back. The system told them that they would not be successful without a college degree, and they believe it. So they've given up. The second factor that is causing unrealistic and unmet expectations are helicopter parents. This starts very early in American culture through youth sports. Everyone gets a trophy no matter how good they played or how good the team did. And in the early ages, they don't even keep score because we want the kids to have fun. But later on in life, they're going to learn that winning is fun and losing sucks. So they're praised for participating, not producing. They've been coddled their whole life. Well-meaning parents, and I've been guilty of this, we try to protect, protect, protect. 
And so it becomes about making sure our kids are always feeling good and we've stopped coaching our kids how to do good in two areas, hard things and scary things. We try to protect them from doing both. And so if they're not doing hard things, they don't develop grit. If they're not doing scary things, they don't develop guts. So how does this expectation problem that has been cultivated in those two areas play out for you? Well, certainly with millennials and now Gen Z, the data shows us that they want more money and more mobility based on showing up. It's about participation, not production, because that's what they've been raised in. So when they don't get more money, get that promotion as soon as they would like or as soon as they think they deserve it, they leave. Now, leaders, that's the context that I want to encourage you to embrace. This isn't fun, and it's really hard. And leaders, this is not your fault. But because you have signed up, raise your hand and said, I want to lead men and women, I want to assure you that it is your responsibility. This is what you've been handed. And if you want to lead, welcome to the hardest part of leadership. Now, there is research that shows from Gallup in the largest study ever done on employee engagement that there are three primary human needs that everyone needs met. And as a leader, you need to be aware of this. They are People need meaning in their work, recognition for their unique contribution, and then a relationship with their leader. And I want to lock in as I encourage you tonight on the relationship part of that human need. Now, that doesn't mean a best friend. And the metaphor that I'll give you tonight to encourage you is the coach. The relationship that these employees need, your employees need, that every human that goes into work needs is a relationship with their leader to where they are being coached. Now, this is simple to understand, but very hard to do. So I think back to my days of sports and my favorite coaches, and then as I study and I've had the opportunity to interview some of the greatest coaches in the world, Coach Mike Krzyzewski from Duke, Nick Saban from Alabama, and here's what I see as what great coaches do and you as leaders can do, and you can meet these employees where they are. Number one is communication. You've got to be clear and consistent You've got to be very clear on what is expected of them. Hey, we're going to keep score here. You get a trophy. You get that raise, that promotion, when you do this, this, and this for this amount of time. And here's how we measure you. Hey, here's how you're doing. You can do better here. We want you to go get some more training. Clear and consistent communication, checking in. How you doing? I noticed you were a little bit off today. You doing okay? That's what a coach would do on the court or on the field. Second, coaches connect. They really get to know their players. They don't treat every player the same. After all, these are individuals and so are your employees. You gotta get to know them on a personal level and then you gotta care for them. You've got to dive in and make sure that they know that you see them, that you hear them, and you want the best for them. That's true connection. Communication is valuable, yes, but connection is where we go deep and we begin to build the bond of loyalty. And they say, you know what? They're pushing me, they're challenging me, but I know why they're challenging me. I can see that there's a better future for me. The third thing that a great coach does is correction. Good coaches will stop practice, blow the whistle, stop, meet that player on the field or on the court and show them in the moment, this is what you did wrong. Here's why it went wrong. Here's how to do it the right way. Look them in the eye. You can do this. Let's run it again. I believe in you. You're okay. It's correction in a kind but firm way. And here's what we know about humans and certainly the younger generation. They are craving mentorship and coaching. They want to make a difference. They're no different than any other generation. So stop poo-pooing them. They just haven't been parented properly. Now they need to be coached. And it's hard, but it's worth it. This reminds me of a question I recently received at one of our Building Wealth events. A supervisor of nursing students stood up and asked the question, how can I 
help my young nursing students deal with anxiety. They're there, they've done the schooling, they're ready to go, but they're terrified. And so I looked at her and I said, ma'am, I would put my hands on their shoulders and I'd look them in the eye and say, you can do hard things. I will help you do these hard things. And the patients that you're going to encounter in this hospital need you to show up and do hard things. I got you. I'm with you the whole way. I'm going to help you. I'm going to guide you. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to train you. I'm going to cheer you on. And I think it's that simple. Leaders, this is the hardest part of leadership. You ask for it. It's time to step up. I understand how it gets frustrating, but if you want to lead and build a great team and a sustainable mission in your organization, you must understand the times in which we live, the environment that has created the workers and their unrealistic and thus unmet expectations. But when you lead like a coach, you can give them realistic expectations and you can help them meet them. And when you do, you may be the guide that stepped in and change the trajectory of their life. You are a coach, lead like it. I know you can do it, and I'm here to help. Ken Coleman, ladies and gentlemen, good word. We had two good back-to-back -back leadership lessons there. It's amazing. I was just watching that and thinking, you know, you could cross out coach and write in crab boat captain. I'm thinking of my buddies up in the Bering Sea, I work on a show called Deadliest Catch. It's been on for like 20 years now. And when I, when I think of the best captains on those boats, and this is arguably the most dangerous job in the world, fishing for king crab on the Bering Sea, it's insanely difficult and dangerous. But the captains who have the greatest respect and who run the best crews and who have the most successful boats are the ones who will come out of the wheelhouse in 20-foot seas, when it's blowing sideways, sleet, rain, freezing rain, 800-pound crab pots, sliding across an ice-covered deck, slickered in snot, unbelievably difficult circumstances, and work the bait bin and start hauling pots with the crew. Some captains don't do that. Some do. And I was there to watch have you guys seen this show, Deadliest Catch? You're, okay, I don't want to assume too much, and I'm not looking for cheap applause, but you'll remember the Greenhorns. The Greenhorn is the toughest job on the boat. It's, it's the newest hire. It's the most inexperienced worker. And the first season that show was on, I thought, man, this is going to do such... This is going to make it so much harder for captains to recruit Greenhorns because we saw guys like lose a finger, we saw boats go down, we saw people cry and get hurt. You know, it was, it was, it was an amazingly extreme show. The next season, nobody had ever, ever seen anything like it. They were standing in line on the docks. People came in from all over the country for a chance to work as a greenhorn, a chance to make no money. A chance to certainly get seasick and maybe get hurt. Do hard things. To do the hard thing. It's, it's so instructive. We were talking about it over dinner last night. You can learn a lot about recruiting from the military. I'm a big fan of all the branches. Love the Army, but you know the proposition. Be all you can be. Sign up. Do your time. You'll come out better than you were. The Navy, the Coast Guard. It's all a version of it's going to be an adventure. It's going to be great. It's good for the country. You should give it a shot, right? Blah, blah. The Marines, it's probably not for you. <laughs> it's okay. We just want a few good men. The uh, proud, right? And so when you, I, what I took from Ken and, and Mike Easter and, and, and Craig is that you can help people sometimes by challenging them. And maybe, maybe you kind of have to. You got to get down in it. You got to get down in it with them, and, and you got to stop. And, and Craig brought this up, and, you know, as leaders, we've got to have, we've got to give folks an exit ramp. Um, ho hopefully, it's as smooth and kind as Craig's. Mine's not always that smooth or kind. Um, 
I mean, we're always very clear, um, but we'll set you free in Jesus' name. And so, um, you know, but the, because, um, you know, we, we very clearly say this is what we do. And if you want to be a we, this is what we do. You may opt out of being a we. You may choose not to be a we, but if you're at Ramsey, this is how we do it. This is who we, it's how we look at the customer. We, we look at our, it's how we look at our resources. We've been blessed to do one thing and that's help people that are not in our building. You know, we exist for the people outside these walls is what we tell our team all the time. And if you're not, if you're not gonna plug into that value system, then you're not a we. And it's okay, you could be a we somewhere else. Well, but sometimes people don't know and they, you know, we have to just tell them, okay, you gotta be a we somewhere else because you're not a we. It's the band of brothers thing. Yeah. I mean, you hear team all the time, but if it's, the, it's the awareness of knowing you're part of a venture that has a purpose that's maybe, maybe greater than your own. And that is, I mean, to me, the best leaders I know create that feeling in the rank and file that there's something larger at stake, whether it's a dirty job, a clean job, a dangerous job, whatever it is, it can't, it can't just be about you. Right, exactly. So the last component of this that is easily overlooked because for, from a leadership or from a particularly a management perspective, but certainly from a leadership perspective, uh, but you, when you back out, pan back far enough that you start seeing the spiritual and the uh, psychological, the mental health issues, it, it, the last thing is the mental health component. Uh, Dr. John Deloney is a Ramsey personality, uh, two PhDs, one in higher ed and one in counseling, which means he has two more PhDs than us put together. And so... Um, Brilliant and a number one best selling book a couple of times. His latest is called Own Your Past, Change Your Future. We did a little quick read with him, a little one chapter book called Redefining Anxiety that's now over 200,000 copies sold. So he's, this stuff is really touching a nerve. He has a podcast that is on Ramsey Networks that has absolutely exploded, all dealing with relationships, mental health issues, boundaries, all these kinds of things. Uh, and obviously, he is here on campus, and so rather than bring him in by a screen, we just thought we'd bring him right here and put him in the chair. So welcome, Dr. John Deloney. Hey, it's not lost on me. There's this legendary, classic, deep radio voice. There's, of course, Mike Rowe. And then there's, hey guys, how's it going? <laughs> Mickey Mouse is here. Hey guys, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a nice tenor. So yeah, it's good to see everybody. Well, <laughs> nice to see you too. <laughs> uh, so John, um, one of the things you and I have talked about online on the Ramsey Show openly, and you talk about it every day on your podcast as well, is, uh, and it falls into the heading of just in general in the workplace, but certainly the 7.2 million males that are not engaged and are uh, really in a sad place to be pitied. Uh, but the, the, the statistics that you and I are continually covering are these what you call diseases of despair. Mm. And uh, I want you to talk about what that is and where we are with them and what's going on. Yeah, so there's this phenomenon, they call them diseases of despair or deaths of despair. And you may have heard that, that term, and it's, it's really made its way into the popular literature as of late. But it shocks most people to find out that over the last three, four, five years, even pulling the COVID numbers out, the average lifespan of a U.S. citizen is going down. And you instantly want to go to the political topics like murder and all. It's not. It's what they're calling deaths of despair. Suicide, addiction, right? Whether it's alcoholism, opioid, fentanyl especially, organ disease failures, heart disease, liver disease. And so when you back up and you look at folks, and this is especially hitting folks with secondary education or less, okay? So you've got this band of human who has been told They've been given this life that, it, that I'll, I'll, it's, I'm overly generalizing it, making it pretty simple, but there's three big things. Number one, purpose, connection, and hope. You have a generation of human who literally has no purpose, 
right? And you, you dismantle overnight what, what I would call traditionally masculine jobs. And it doesn't mean there's not incredible women in the trades and incredible women police officers. Of course there are. But overnight, we took them out of schools. We took them out of the workforce. We said, you're, you're an idiot if you do this. Or if you can't cut it over here, you can take the B-team jobs. We've got entire cities saying we'd just rather do without police officers. And then you got firefighters, folks like that, who work really, really hard, and their salary can no longer pay for a home and a car and, and clothes for three kids, right? And so you look around, and you know what makes purposelessness go away? Alcohol, opioids, or even Netflix. Netflix has solved this crisis. They just took that away. They were like, hey, look, we know you better than most of your friends. We're just going to start the next episode for you. And we just go, oh, okay, okay. And we just watch it. <laughs> we just watch it, right? And so fentanyl works. You know what else works? Rage. Being angry all the time, it duct tapes over that feeling of, I, I serve no role. And y'all have talked about it earlier. Mike, you said this a few years ago when you, hear, when you were here on campus and it haunted me. When we told 300 million Americans, hey, you're, we don't need you, just go home, we'll send you checks. There's some literature on um, veterans with PTSD and, the, and some of the emerging conversations are the worst thing you can do is tell somebody, hey, you are broken forever. Just go home, full disability. We don't need you anymore. We'll just mail checks. It takes people's soul from them, right? Then number two, this idea of, of connection. We have created the loneliest generation in human history. If you, if you send somebody to prison and you take away their family, their home, they take away everything. You, we keep one card in our back pocket for prisoners and you get in trouble in jail we put you in isolation. We send you to the hole because it's torture. And that's the world we've created for ourselves. Even with me, like take me and my wife, for instance, I can text her all day. I love you. 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 And it goes into her brain as data, but her body never feels safe. It never feels loved like it does when I walk in the door and I see her and I smile and say, I'm so happy to see you. Or when I do something insane, like pick up my underwear, right? Like, the let her know I'm loved. We have the loneliest generation ever. And so you got a group of people with no purpose and no community, no, no group of people around them. And that, then it leads me to the third picture. And this is why, my man, I, and I say this with all due respect, not just because you're sitting here, what you have given people with dirty jobs. It, hope, I think for hope, you have to have a picture. And I had a couple of football coaches who showed me what this looked like. My dad was a homicide detective and a SWAT guy. I have a picture in my head of a guy putting on a bulletproof vest and going into the fire, right? We don't have that anymore. We just took it out. And now you've got no hope because there's no picture. That's why shows like what you do, man, are so critical because at least it gives some kid flipping channels a glimpse of hey, those guys are smiling and they're doing hard work and I've never even seen that, that done, right? So you've got no hope, you've got no um, community, you've got no accountability and you've got no purpose. And then Dave, we're wondering why anxiety and depression rates are shooting up through the, through the roof. We've just pulled the thread on every single thing that makes us whole. And we said, go out and get them. And man, they're going out and getting them in the basement, right? With their headphones on. <laughs> At least you're picking up your underwear. It's a start. There's a reason my wife is not here tonight, Mike. <laughs> hey, uh, thank you for the kind words about the show. Um, I do think that we're surrounded by examples. We talked about it before. You know, the way we portray work is a conscious choice. Um, we get to decide the definition of a good job. There's a bunch of stuff we can't decide, but we're totally in control of that. And we're totally in control of the degree to work eth of work ethic we we choose to embrace. But to an earlier point too, it's not just what's on the TV, it's not just what's on the screen, it's what's in our schools. And when we took shop class out of high school, my God, we unleashed the Kraken, right? <laughs> when we took shop class out of high school, we affirmatively said, and tell me if you agree, we, we told a whole generation of kids, in so many words, these jobs are so unimportant you don't even get to look at them. Yeah. Wood shop, metal shop, auto shop, all those things. 
We just, we just took them right out. We arbitraged them yeah. right out of the curricula. And we're still reaping the whirlwind, I think. We did that on top of telling a generation of three, four, and five, and six-year-old, especially little boys, you're the problem. If you can't sit still and shut your mouth for eight hours and do this worksheet, you are the problem. You need to be pumped full of medication. You need to be set out aside because you're the issue. And then when you get to, to middle school, and I, I got a little boy, man, and it gets... I remember some of those early conversations, and my wife was Dr. Deloney long before me, and she can stare laser beams through somebody telling her that there's a problem with her son, right? And so we sat in these meetings, and then they go to middle school, and they go to high school, and there's no outlet. And then the only, the only potential path is a glorified version that cost $100,000 of the hell they just went through. And then we're surprised that they just head to the basement and say, Mom, cash out your retirement. I'm playing games. Of course, that's where I would go. That's where I'd go, right? Makes perfect sense. We, we, we've stolen from the kids. We've stolen from them. And by the way, let's be honest, like we're participating in this too. For 20 years, I've sat with moms and dads of students um, in my former job. And the conversations were about, hey, my kid's got anxiety. My kid's struggling with ADHD. What I would consider routine questions about how to love your kid and how to learning exceptionalities, all that stuff. The questions I get now are, is this thing over? Has democracy run aground? Are we done? And that's a complete absence of hope, of people just cashing their chips out. And I think it's up to us to begin to spread optimism, begin to spread joy, and begin to put um, light back in a dark place. And that starts with us helping these kids out, and it starts with us cheering up at our own homes and our own interactions with people. And I mean, it starts with us, guys. It starts with us. Absolutely. One of the things we talk about a lot is that, um, and we're talking about this hard things, but the idea, and um, again, you and I have unpacked this, so I'm, it's an underhand pitch back to you, but the, um, this idea that the, the, the weird thing is, is the, there's a circular argument here or a circular cause effect thing. It's not as simple as one direction in that uh, depression, for instance, or anxiety is lowered with activity and vitamin D in the sun, right? I mean, movement, yeah, physical the, movement, the, also engaging and winning at something. So good hard work where you get some wins uh, if you don't have that, it tends towards depression. If you do have depression, it tends to help be part of the answer to solve it. I'm not a mental health professional. You are. Tell me about yeah, that. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, I think this, the latest studies out of Australia where they're recommending frontline step one of someone struggling with depression is exercise, movement. Go move, right? Your body well, releases was, chemicals. It, I mean, your body's made to move, right? Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> Let me say it like this. So you remember the self-esteem movement? We like to bag on it, and, and it came from, a, a, I think, what I think is a good place. They looked at, at CEOs, and they said, what is making these CEOs so CEO-y? And it was this irrational belief in themselves. They can do anything in any capacity. In, in, a, in an effort to help a generation of young people, they took that irrational belief and they tried to just inject it into kids by just telling it to them over and over and over again. And what they failed to understand is that irrational belief comes from failing a whole lot and getting punched in the eye and getting back up and failing and getting back up and getting back up and getting back up. This irrational belief was not irrational. They learned, they were confident because they had accomplished their way towards this goal and had gotten really lucky along the way. And so we just have a generation of kids that we've like, you're special, you're special, here's a trophy, here's a thing. And we've robbed them the opportunity of falling down and getting back up, right? We've taken it from them. I'm just thinking about the early episodes of American Idol. You know, we all remember the winners. We remember the final competition. But my favorite episodes are like the, the very first ones where a couple thousand people, many in their early 20s, show up to audition. And it's not the fact that most of them can't sing that's so fascinating. It's the fact that they don't know it. No one told them. 
<laughs> no one told them. No one told them until Simon Cowell came along. They have no it's one a, that loves them. They have uh, the worst moms. And, uh, no one told them. To see the look of horror on a 22-year-old's face, to learn for the first time on national television that they can't carry a tune in a bucket, right? This is not a good way to raise your kids. There's just no consequence along the way. There's no truth. That's why Simon Cowell is you're worth special. $600 you're million. Special. Dollars. You're right. special. You can't sing. You can't well, sing. Simon Cowell became everybody's surrogate dad, right? I, hey, I used to have students who would come and they would sit in my office and they would say, hey, I need you to know um, after years of intense prayer, God has called me to be a, a Christian music singer. And then they would sing and I would say, I assure you, he didn't. <laughs> he didn't. God, I'm, I'm God. confident. I'm God. confident. You're praying too again. <laughs> You're probably going to head back to the old prayer closet. Yeah. <laughs> so, listen, there's, there's this idea of confidence. What does confidence come from? It comes from little steps towards a goal, right? When I first joined the radio, I remember COVID happened and Dave was like, hey man, I know you got an 18 month ramp up plan. We're gonna have to figure it out live because I helped you, I hired you to help hurting people and the whole country's hurting. I was not confident. And I had somebody that walked alongside me and showed me, hey, don't do that. And would dive across the desk and <laughs> keep me from canceling the show. All kinds of things that he kept the thing going. But you, I gained confidence slowly, not just because Dave said, you're great, you're great. But we walked, he walked alongside me. I had some scaffolding there and we walked alongside it. And that's how you gain confidence. What I take from your work, honestly, and one of the great lessons of, of Dirty Jobs, too, was that just because, just because you love something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. <laughs> and, and, Dude, that's and, the t-shirt of the night, man. <laughs> and, and conversely... There's a lot of wives elbowing their husbands right now. <laughs> yeah, pick up your underwear. And, uh, and just as importantly... Just because you, you hate something or really have no interest in it doesn't mean you might not be great at it. My mom and dad are listening right now at home to this live stream. My mom called me in 2000, good grief, when was it? Probably 2003, working at Evening Magazine, and, and said to me, look, your, your granddad's 90 years old. He's not going to live forever. Wouldn't it be great if before he died, he could turn on the TV and see you doing something that looked like work? <laughs> so my pop, he, he, could, he was a magician. He could build or fix anything. And I was so sure I was going to follow in his footsteps all the way into my teens until I realized the inescapable truth of my reality was that the handy gene is <laughs> recessive. And just because I wanted it doesn't mean I could do it. And when he told me that I could be a tradesman, but to simply get a different toolbox, things started to make sense. And it, it lines up perfectly with everything you guys have said tonight. It's, it's not about our dreams. It's not about our wish fulfillment. And it's not purely about our skills. It's about lining it all up showing up early, staying late, and playing the cards we got as best we can. This isn't an outline, but can I just talk about something that yeah. gives me hemorrhoids? Listen, don't, this I whole follow your passion thing. Listen, you become passionate about what you're good at, and you become good at what you practice. And most of us practice at least in my world, what I was made to practice. Somebody said, you're gonna take care of this stuff. You're gonna keep showing up, you're gonna keep showing up so you can do this job. And I have become passionate about things I originally didn't like. My mom made me take piano lessons. And now, 30 something years later, I can run around on stage with a guitar because she made me do that stuff, right? And so this idea like I have to feel good all the time. No, man, you gotta work really hard. And you, the passion and the joy and the love will follow that hard work and that accomplishment and that achievement. It's, it's magical. This guy's on the payroll? Absolutely. You should keep him. I'm trying. <laughs> Hope he doesn't quite quit, yeah. Um, yeah, it is hard to be on a live stream about working and your boss is like right there. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. So John's new book is coming out in the fall called Building a Non-Anxious Life. Um, 
since I'm the CEO, I get the privilege of reading the manuscripts before we put them out with Ramsey Publishing and, uh, and even making some comments here or there. And, and we've just finished the, uh, the final polishing on this and getting it ready to print for the fall. Uh, and, and in that process, uh, to build a non-anxious life in a, in a highly anxious, actually the most anxious culture in the history of humankind, how do you build a non-anxious life? Uh, the core of the message is choosing the hard path. So there we go again, doing hard things. But still, uh, I, I think that's important from a leader's perspective, from a worker's perspective, whether they are uh, aspiring to be successful, they are ambitious, or whether they maybe tonight got a little bit of fire lit under them, a little bit of hope where they didn't have it before. Talk about this idea of choosing the hard path. Yeah, so I actually finished Michael Easter's book and I called him. I fought, tried, I used my uh, powers as a YouTuber to find out how to get in touch with him. And he picks up the phone and he was on a hike in Nevada. And I just said, hey, I need you to know your book uh, is going to change my life. I read it. I, I blacked out some words and I handed it to my 12 year old son and said, this is your next book. You have to read it. And we're going to talk about it at our weekly breakfast. And my son went through it. So that was kind of the genesis of it is this idea that your body's made for hard things. Um, it's like, We've created a culture where we all go to the gym and we took all the weight off the bar. And now we're all mad that we're not getting any stronger and we're blaming the gym, right? It's on us. We've created this world. And also, you can't just walk into the gym and load it up with every plate in there. You're going to kill yourself, right? You have to have spotters and you have to have people that walk alongside you, right? So um, we've created a world that our bodies can't exist in. And here's the, the meta message about choose your heart. Being 100 pounds overweight is really hard. It hurts, it's uncomfortable. You don't sleep. Losing 100 pounds is miserable. The option isn't one is easier than the other. The path before you is to choose your heart. Being a good husband who listens and says the words I'm sorry and keeps showing up and keeps showing up, that's hard. And having a miserable marriage is also hard. So the path forward is not, I'm just gonna take the easy road or I'm gonna go do this hard thing. No, you're gonna do a hard thing either way. Choose the one that is most beneficial for your family, for you, for your faith, for your legacy. Choose your heart. And man, if you're married and you can sit down and say, who are we gonna become? Let's reverse engineer who we are gonna become and we're gonna do hard stuff together, whether that's doing a budget together, whether that's committing to not going to bed angry, that's committing to get on the same page with your parenting, whatever it is, choose your heart, man. That's, that's, that's it. At the end of the day, you gotta choose your heart. Yeah, so as, as we wrap this up, I'm gonna take a left turn right quick uh, as, as we wrap up this section. Politically? As a, huh? I was just kidding. A right turn, okay, I don't do I'm left turns. Right. Right I, don't, I don't have a left turn on my car, but the... Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Notice that everybody's to his left. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Dave <laughs> only even takes right turns in his car. It's so straight. The, uh, uh, what I don't want someone to come away hearing, I mean, you got a PhD in higher education. You came out of higher education. And I don't want them to hear Mike Rowe say, because he didn't, or Dave Ramsey say, or Dr. John Deloney say, that we are anti-four-year degree, or that we're anti higher education. We are not. It, higher education is awesome when applied properly. The, the, the fallback position or the, the problems we've outlined somewhat is that we, we left the trades out in the discussion. That's a horrible thing. We've, just, we've covered that. But in higher ed, we were talking about this the other night on a panel in California, John, you and I, the currency got, you know, what happened was in the 50s and 40s, we started realizing it was, you know, it was very smart to become smarter, to gather knowledge. Knowledge would help you go to places you hadn't gone before. Knowledge was great. And we became, we associated that with becoming educated. He's well-educated. She's well-read. She's literate. He, she's, you know, and well-spoken, articulate, has a, you know, an actual vernacular and so on. And, and so we, we began to associate that. And then we dumbed it down, oddly enough, in education to say that that means a degree. And so instead of making knowledge the currency of success, and by the way, success comes from 
increasing your knowledge. If you graduate from anything and you stop learning then, by definition, you have stunted your growth. People who are successful are continual learners. They're engaging in things like you all are engaging tonight. Thank you for watching and for being in the audience. You're getting information you didn't have to have a better life tomorrow that you didn't have yesterday. That's adding to your knowledge base. And so knowledge is the currency of success. It's what you spend. It's what you collect. It's what you make deposits in in order to build success. Not a degree. And we changed the message and said the degree is a guarantee of success, which is a complete lie, and we all know that. And then we made it even worse. We said the degree in anything, I mean, German polka history, left-handed puppetry, whatever nuanced crap that makes you into a barista, right? You can get a degree in anything that makes you useless in the marketplace. You can get no job doing that except teaching other people to get that degree. That's the only job there is for German polka history graduates is to teach other German polka history graduates. It's the only job there is. Doesn't exist, by the way, I made all this up. But the um, point being that the degree doesn't matter and a, worse than that, a degree that doesn't add a knowledge base that's useful in the marketplace does not give you an ROI on your investment into education. And so we're not angry at higher ed, angry at $1.7 trillion in student loan debt that has partly stolen the hope and increased the anxiety of two entire generations and the idiot Congress that continues to make these loans to 19-year-olds who couldn't get a loan to buy a dog at the pet store, but we, the people, give them an $85,000 loan to get a degree in left-handed puppetry. This is dumber than a rock, America, okay? It's out of control. And worse than that, we stand around talking about how they're so bad we should forgive them, and at the same time, we're making them. That's intellectually dishonest to Washington, D.C. That's my message to the Island of Misfit Toys right there. So anyway, the, this whole thing of higher ed is not bad. I, all three of my kids have degrees. I have a degree. And I, the, the stuff I got in my, the tools I put in my belt to get a degree in finance and real estate at the University of Tennessee, Go Vols, have helped me grow Ramsey Solutions, right? So I am, we are not against education. We're against stupid education, overpriced education, and the idea that a degree makes you somehow a superior human, and that a degree is actually the currency that you can trade on to get success. None of those are true. All that times 10 for me. Um, I'll also say something in defense of screens, since we gave them a pretty bad rap tonight. Um, when I graduated in 1984, two years at a community college, Went to work briefly, then I went to a university and got my communications degree. So I'm a communicator. Um, I didn't have the device that you're all holding or sitting on right now. I didn't have an internet connection and I didn't have a smartphone, which means I didn't have access to 98% of the known information in the world, right? If you have a curious mind, you're armed with a fearsome tool more fearsome than anything you referred to in your tool belt right now. You have unlimited free access to all of the knowledge on planet Earth. I just watched a lecture from MIT two weeks ago. Lying in bed, I woke up, flicked around, there it was. It was for free. And it was the same thing that that lecture hall full of kids paid who knows what for. My point is it's out there. And in 2016, some of you will remember this, during the presidential debate, Marco Rubio made a quick comment. I forget what the back and forth was exactly, but he said, to great applause, what our country needs is more welders and fewer philosophers, right? So, oh my gosh, it was a big applause line, and I went over to my screen later that night on my little Facebook page where six million of my friends said, hey, sounds like this guy's singing your tune. And I had to tell him the truth. And the truth is, no, that's not my tune. My tune is our country needs more welders who can quote Descartes and Nietzsche and Thoreau, who I believe first said all men lead lives of quiet desperation. We need welders who are curious enough to access the most powerful tool in their box and get the liberal arts education available to them for free. Conversely, we also need more philosophers who can run a straight and even bead. 
We need both sides of our brain equally engaged in this great gift that we have. And to talk about blue collar versus white collar, well, where do you think the skills gap lives? It's right between those two binary fallacious choices. The color of collars is nonsense. That ship has sailed. And until we get people who can talk intelligently and with, with real curiosity and satisfy that curiosity in the ways that I'm, that I'm talking about and at the same time master a skill that's in demand, then we're going to keep pushing this rock up the hill, I'm afraid. So let me speak directly to business owners for just a minute and leaders out there, some of you that run small businesses. In that same survey, that same piece of research I told you earlier, Ramsey research team did, um, we found that despite all these challenges, that seven in 10 business owners rarely or never think of giving up. So if you're here or you're watching and you're a business owner or you're in a senior leadership position, there's a seven out of 10 chance that you already have courage and grit and resilience. Uh, and what we're saying tonight is we really need you. America needs you. The future of this country needs you to stay in that fight and do the things that Craig Groeschel was talking about. Do some of the stuff we're going to give you in here in just a few minutes. We need you to stay in the fight. My grandkids need you to stay in that fight. Our future depends on it. So we've got three really kind of tactical suggestions, some solutioning, if you will, for some of this whining we've been doing for the last couple of hours. Um, number one, if you're hiring out there, start a referral program. If you get some good people on your team, I heard a guy years ago, he said, you can't win the Kentucky Derby with a donkey. You need a thoroughbred. So when you get some thoroughbreds on your team, what you're going to figure out is, is that we become who we hang around with, and thoroughbreds run with other thoroughbreds. So the easiest way to find new team members that are thoroughbreds is to send your existing herd of thoroughbreds out into the marketplace, and we at Ramsey, we pay you a bounty if you bring in your friends who are thoroughbreds. The other good thing about thoroughbreds is they know their family and they know their friends that are donkeys and they don't want to work with them. So they will tell you, don't hire him. I saw him in here interviewing. Don't hire her. She's not good. Don't do that. She's not a we. Don't do that. They'll tell you. I'll tell you right up front, and, and, and it works. We get a, a good percentage of our hires currently in this crazy world we're talking about right now of quality people that care deeply, that are thoroughbreds, that know their stuff through referrals. And we, we do it all the time, don't we, John? Yeah, man, you hand out cash in the staff meetings. It, it works. It works. And hey, I've got, I'm thinking of two friends right now. If I texted them and said, I'm, I've locked myself in a closet, this crazy guy named Dave Ramsey's trying to kill me. I need help. They're back in Texas. And they would say, the government took away our license, so we're gonna be on a bus, just hang in for about 18 hours and we'll be there. And they would come to my defense. They'll be at my funeral. God, I would never hire them. They're the worst. <laughs> <laughs> never hire them. They're my closest best friends in the world. They're not, they're not people that I'm gonna work with day in and day out, right? Right. So referrals is a good one. Another one. <laughs> Or, or, or non-referrals non in this case. Uh, another one's tell a good story. Oh man, everything's a story, right? If you, if you don't have a good story, then, well, you don't have a pitch. And if you're trying to hire, uh, then all you've got is a salary, right? All, all you have is an offer. It's give them a narrative, give them the, a, a beginning and a middle and an end. Dirty Jobs was about stories. And now, to be fair, it was the same story over and over. It was the story of somebody who mastered a skill that was in demand and then applied it and then enjoyed something that looked a lot like prosperity. But, you know, tell them the truth about what the opportunity is. And if the occasion arises, you know, find the heroes, find the heroes in history, find your personal heroes. You know, we were talking about Shackleton earlier. You know, one of the greatest explorers of all time, who I think displayed the greatest uh, leadership of, of all time. Nobody died on that ship that was locked in the ice for like over a year. 
I mean, what he did was extraordinary. And if you read The Endurance, yeah. right, if you read that book, uh, you can't fail but to be inspired. So, you know, people get their inspiration from different places. Just make sure you find yours somewhere. Yeah, and his ad, when he got asked people to come and join him, was put in the local newspaper. He said, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. That's exactly what was in my job description. <laughs> <laughs> he got 5,000 applications. He got 5,000 applications. It's just like the, the greenhorn on the, the crab boat. Exactly. Same thing. Tell them the truth. But it's but, a great story. Yeah. This is going to be hard. You're going to be changed by how hard it is. You're going to be formed by how hard it is. You're going to be doing work that matters. You're going to be doing something that matters. Plug in. And let me tell you, Gen Z and millennials, the good ones, they are more missional than the other generations put together. They will buy into this. You want, I've got 450 of them on the team. They are an amazing generation. They're amazing. Now, the good ones. And they're an amazing generation because there's only two kinds, awesome and sucks. So... <laughs> You can pick out the other ones real quick. Like, no, no, you're not a we. And, but the, the, man, I love these guys because they, they embrace this kind of thing. They embrace a narrative, a story that's real, and we're real. This is who we are. I mean, we are changing people's lives. We're changing their family trees. John's changing their mental health. Ken's changing their, their, their whole career track and path and doing stuff like we're doing tonight. This is stuff that matters. This is not empty rhetoric. And so they get to plug into that, and that's a narrative. That's a story they want to do. I remember um, when I was in Texas one Christmas, and it was like everyone decided to be the Griswolds, and it was uh, a, an unseasonably freezing patch of weather. And everybody turned their Christmas lights on seemingly at the same time. And the transformer right behind my house blew and we had no anything. And, you know, I, we've got a newborn. I got my son. I'm trying to be super tough. I don't, I'm just flipping the breaker on and off, just doing nothing. And then this guy drives up in a truck at about 2.30 in the morning. And I got up. My son was still up because we were freezing. We went outside and he goes up in this big bucket truck, changes the thing out. And I just walked out into the alley and I said, man, thank you. Like you saved us. And he said, y'all are mine. And it was this, oh. he's like, this is my, when the, when the grid lights up, it lights her out. This is, y'all are mine. He was a part of the story, right? And he, he knew all these Christmases depend on me. And dude, that dude was out there at 2.30 and it was freezing cold. And I just remember thinking, this is incredible what's happened in front of my son, man. You know what I mean? I, I, here's how much I love that story. I was on my way to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with the Golden Knights for a, for a show. And I was completely in my head and I was nervous, going to pull my own chute. This is at Fort Bragg seven years ago, maybe. And I'm checking out of the Holiday Inn Express and I'm walking down the hallway. And I see a guy on a ladder. I only see half his body right? He's, he's up in the ceiling doing something. And I walk by and I look up and he looks down and he sees me. He says, Mike Crow, dirty jobs. I said, yeah, hey, how are you? And he comes down the ladder and I said, what are you doing up there? And he said, well, my customers are upset. My pipes, something's going on up here. And if I don't get my pipes fixed by two, my customers are going to be this, that, and the other. And he, he talked for a minute, but it was the pronouns. Like, there's a bit of headlines going on about our choice of pronouns these days. You think? But this guy was all about my pipes, my customers. So on the way to jump out of this perfectly good airplane, I took a picture of the guy, and I took a picture of the hole in the ceiling, and I wrote the story I just told you. It wasn't much of a story, but it was a story, and it had a moral. And it was, you know, when you run into people who personalize their work, and truly own it. A janitor in the ceiling got me out of my head so quick. So I just write him up, I throw it out there on Facebook, I go, I jump out of a perfectly good plane, I go back to the hotel later that night and I log on my screen and I look at this post. It had reached 14 million people. So the moral of this story, say what you want about social media, say what you want about all of it, people are starved not just to hear these stories, but to share them. And they're simple stories. They're simple stories about dignity and ownership. Thirdly, if you're recruiting and trying to bring people onto your team, 
uh, you have to be attractive. You have to be a leader, that some, become the leader. Identify, as we said earlier, uh, quoting James Clear, change your identity. I am a leader of an incredible, well-run organization that has a culture that loves its team, takes care of its team, and expects a lot from its team, and coaches its team, and corrects its team. I am that leader. I'm a world-class leader. And, and that's the narrative. That's the identity that you assume. You have to become that person because that's who people want to work with. That's who they want to be. They don't want a boss. We don't have bosses at Ramsey. We don't even have managers at Ramsey. Managers count stuff. We have leaders. We just have leaders. That's all we have. We have 200 leaders out of our 1,100. And it's the leadership team, not the management team. Uh, and because we're not managing, we're leading. We're going to show you where it is. We're going to be ahead of you. Leaders are in front. Bosses are behind. And you, you move the whole herd at the speed of the lowest common denominator when you're a boss. When you're a leader, you're out front. And somebody might not make the train, but maybe they weren't a we. Because this is our speed and you can't keep up. This is our level of excellence and you can't deliver. And so maybe you don't get to stay on the train. And, and that's a leader out front. So you've got to become an attractive leader that's telling the stories that's building the referrals, that's pulling this together. And those are three really practical things you can work on if you're in leadership in an organization and you're trying to attract team members right now. It's very, very real. So when it comes to hiring, don't acquiesce. Craig said that earlier. Don't, don't give up and say, I'm just gonna bring bodies. Because that's a short play, that's the easy wrong and when you just bring the bodies in and you give up, you just go, I give up, I gotta have the help, I gotta have the help, screw it, I gotta get this project out, screw it, I gotta get four people on this, screw it. You're bringing crazy into your building and you're gonna be running an asylum. <laughs> you're gonna have enough monkeys, you're gonna be a ringmaster. I mean, it's a problem. And, and every time we have let our guard down at Ramsey, we, we hire too quickly because we get all excited about the projects, all excited about the outputs, and we don't pay enough attention to who's coming in the door, it causes us so much problems that we can't get the projects out anyway because we're sidelined by cray-cray all through the building. <laughs> and it's just, and there ain't nothing worse than managing crazy, man. It's, just, it's hard to get out once it gets in. So take your time and do this stuff right. Hiring is hard. It's one of the hardest things you're gonna do as a leader. For over a decade, we've helped tens of thousands of small businesses with all kinds of things on how to run their business, but hiring is always the number one thing they wanna learn about. And it's one of the things that drove us to do this tonight is to say, in this environment, it's the worst, it's the hardest it's ever been, but don't acquiesce to it. Don't fall for it. If you don't match our values, you shouldn't be here. You just stand for that because that's your best long-term play. It's your best long-term play. You might get some work done by Friday with the other, but you're gonna struggle with it. So in this Entree Leadership Elite that I mentioned earlier, you get a free 30-day trial with it. It's got the tools, it's got the coaching, it's got the lessons in there. There's a key lesson in there on hiring, and we're gonna give you a free 30-day trial and just click on this QR code and it'll show you how to get in this thing and you can learn these tools and how to level up in your business, how to take your business to another level, how to take your organization to another level and, and go to the next thing. Again, it's a completely, did I mention it's free, a free 30-day trial. The other thing I want you guys to check out, and Mike, I want you to unpack this, is the MicroWorks Foundation. The scholarship work that you are doing through that foundation and the actual work you're doing and the spirit that you're injecting into America is, it's singular. There's no one else doing it. Talk about it. Thanks. I think you're right. It's important to be attractive. It's also important to be persuasive. Um, your most persuasive um, spokespeople for your businesses or your own employees and your satisfied customers. And I, I learned that uh, in, in Dirty Jobs and I, I learned it in my foundation right now. I still lead it, but the people that do most of the talking for me now are our scholarship recipients who five, six years later are now telling their stories. And their stories are welders, female welders making 160 grand a year all day long. Plumbers, steam fitters, pipe fitters, people who have proven HVAC, right? That something that looks a lot like prosperity can happen as the result of mastering a skill. 
After my mom called me all those years ago to tell me to do something that looked like work, Dirty Jobs happened. Halfway through Dirty Jobs, this foundation started. It too is a tribute to my granddad, and uh, how it evolved doesn't really matter. What matters is right now in 2013, we'll give away a million dollars next month and another million in September, specifically for work ethic scholarships. That's what we do. We don't give scholarships for thanks. I appreciate it. But to Dave's point, we've got no truck with four-year degrees. No problem at all. If you can afford it, great. If you want to do it, fantastic. But these scholarships are reserved for people who want to learn a skill that's in demand. And so we get thousands of applicants now. We go through all of them. And there are some hoops to jump through. I need references. You know, not one, not two. I need a pile of references. I need an essay. I want a video. You have to sign our sweat pledge. You have to make a case for yourself. And I say this to you uh, not because I'm going to put the arm on you for a donation. It's easy to donate if you want to. I've never done big fundraisers. We've There's 50,000 folks watching this online. Somebody needs to send them a million dollars tonight, okay? Oh, just, well, that'd be terrific. Thanks I'll just go put the arm on you. Just do it right now. All right. Look, it's the money is great. But the purpose of the foundation, to be perfectly candid, is not to help as many people as possible. It's not to change as many lives as possible through our scholarship program. It's to help the people who can tell my story better than me. And finally, after 15 years, we're doing it. The evidence demands a verdict, as Josh McDowell famously said Absolutely. all those years ago. And that's what we're doing. If you want to help out, consider yourself officially invited. We do these scholarship programs every six months, and that's who we are. So to summarize, we're, guys, we're in the middle of, and folks, we're in the middle of this war on work. Um, what can those of us who are business owners, and those of us who are watching or in here who aren't business owners or aren't in a leadership do to begin to impact these nine or ten different variables we've laid out here that are causing this labor crisis. The labor crisis is a symptom. It's not a problem. It's a pathology. It's not the disease. And so, to go back to Eberstadt, and uh, so it's, not the, it's the effect. It's not the cause. So how do we get up under this uh, obviously, we're not going to do it in one night. It's not three easy lessons in a poem. Um, it, it's, but there are some things that we can do. Uh, what do we do about this, John? I say you start with moms and dads and grandparents. If your kids don't have chores, you're stealing from them. You're stealing their ability to learn. You're stealing their dignity. You're stealing their, uh, their opportunity to learn confidence in themselves. So at home, give them chores, hold them accountable. Don't give them an allowance, pay them a salary or pay them on commission. Teach them, sit them down and let them, force them to make you, to, to watch you do a budget. Begin to bring them along in this crazy adventure called life. Don't wrap your arms around them and say, I'm, I'm your bubble wrap and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna protect you. We've tried that and it has failed. So all of this stuff starts in the home with those little eyes. And by the way, kids don't listen to you, they watch you. You want them to be hard workers, you work hard. You want them to not complain about everything, stop complaining. You want them to not be scared of everything, turn the freaking news off and be connected with your kids. They watch you, it starts in the home. For those of you that are in the workforce working, Stop romanticizing mediocrity. This is Karl Marx's message. Don't embrace it. It's called communism. Stop embracing it. And don't, don't hang out with people. Say, not in my presence. You're not going to say, I'm going to work as little as possible, I'm going to do as little as possible, and I am expected to get free stuff because I breathe air. Good, you're not going to be in my presence. I don't want to hang around with you because that's a wrong philosophy, and I don't want that disease. I don't want it to rub off on me. Not as for me and my house, we're going to go for it. We're going to leave it all on the field. We may lose, but everything's going to be left on the field. 
So we're not gonna embrace mediocrity. We're not gonna say ambition is a bad word, success is a bad word, winning is a bad word, building wealth as a result of having served a huge number of people is a bad thing. It's not. And so hanging out with me, if you bump into me somewhere, people don't come up to me and go, hey, I think credit cards are great. Because they know where I stand. <laughs> Let people know where you stand on this subject of success, on this subject of mediocrity, on this subject of, I think it's great to steal from your employer. I don't, I think you're a thief when you go to work and you don't work while you're at work and you're being paid to work. That's just wrong morally and ethically. Stand up for something. Push back against this garbage that is being shoveled out there. It has to stop, and it doesn't stop until a whole bunch of us raise our hand and say, not on my watch. Man, that's good. Um, so I think the country still needs the Boy Scouts and Skills USA and the 4-H Club and a lot of these youth civic organizations. The Boy Scouts saved my life. And of the many scout laws, or there's only one scout law, but 12 components, right? Trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent. Um, don't forget cheerful. It's buried in there, but it was at the guts of dirty jobs. There was a mission, there was a theme, but be of good cheer. Be in on the joke. Look for the humor where you can find it. Pick up your underpants and smile about it, right? <laughs> Right? And, and call it back four times in one talk in one evening. Yeah. I know how to land the plane, dude. Stay with me. <laughs> hey, let it be known I had a great underwear joke that I didn't just make then. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. And don't pick them up while you're wearing them. <laughs> so, you know, the scout law was interesting to me because it was the first time somebody asked me to raise my right hand and and promise something. Um, the pledge, of course, to the flag came before that, but I wasn't raising my hand, I was, I was putting it over my heart. And the 4-H and Skills USA, all these organizations, they have a code. They, they, they challenge you to make a promise to yourself. And it's easy to make fun of that, you know? And it's become very uncool to do that kind of thing. But I mentioned the SWEAT pledge in my foundation. SWEAT stands for skill and work ethic aren't taboo. And this pledge says things like, the number one is I'm, I'm grateful above all things. I live in America. I've won the greatest lottery of all time. I walk the earth, I'm alive. You know, I already won, right? 11 other tenants like that. And if you don't agree with those things and if you can't sign those things, then I get to say what you just said in my own way, which is, well, okay, this particular pile of free money is not for you, right? And we can move on. But at the, at the center of all of it is a request to make a, a promise to do a thing. So challenge your people to do that. It doesn't matter if it's corny. Mission statements matter if they come from the heart and they reflect your own identity, and they reflect the identity of your company. Ramsey Solutions has an identity. That's obvious. Their mission is tattooed on all of their literature and in everything I've ever heard you say. There's a version of that in every going concern that I've ever seen and in every decent charity that I've ever encountered. So be of good cheer, but make a promise and try and keep it. So I'm 62. When I was 12, 50 years ago, <laughs> literally, yeah. Uh, how do you recover from that? Um, <laughs> my dad and mom were in the real estate business, and they took us to, took me to this uh, a series of things. But that year, I remember specifically, we went to a sales training and motivational thing. Um, Zig Ziglar who I was blessed to later become friends with, was head, headlining and speaking and uh, absolutely incredible, iconic. If you're in the auditorium tonight, there's actually a wall out there dedicated to him as you go out. Um, one of the other speakers was the famous Les Brown, uh, another great voice and a passionate, wonderful orator. Really, really great job. And 50 years ago, 
he wrapped it up that night with this. And uh, I can't think of anything better than the Mike Rowe with this narrative voice to read this out for us. It's not this thick, relax. <laughs> this thing? That thing. Mind if I put my glasses on? Yeah, you will, because you won't be able to read otherwise. One year behind you, brother. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I do not choose to be a common man. It is my right to be uncommon, if I can. I seek opportunity, not security. I do not wish to be a kept citizen, humbled and dulled by having the state look after me. I want to take the calculated risk to dream, to build, to fail, and to succeed. I refuse to barter incentive for a dole. I prefer the challenges of life to the guaranteed existence, the thrill of fulfillment to the stale calm of utopia. I will not trade freedom for beneficence, nor buy dignity for a handout. I will never cower before any master, nor bend to any threat. It is my heritage to stand erect, proud, and unafraid to think and act for myself, to enjoy the benefit of my creations, and to face the world boldly and say, this I have done. All this is what it means to be an American. And pick up your underwear. <laughs> well, the bottom line is each of us has got a part to play and each of us has got a choice. And the change that we're all looking for begins with me. And the change that you're looking for begins with you. Uh, the good news is, is that there's a lot of us left. We're not out of business. Common sense is not gone. Strong character is not has not dissipated and completely disappeared off the planet, contrary to what you see on the news. There are actual human beings out there like you and me that care about this stuff, and hopefully tonight we've given you a little information and a little inspiration to stand in the gap and help us solve this and make capitalism work. Because capitalism works when we love our customers, and when we, it works when we love our team, and it works when we work. Thanks for being here tonight. God bless y'all.